What does travel mean to you? Exploring the world? Creating memories? Meeting new people? Disconnecting from it all? But what about making a difference? Because our travels mean so much more than we realize. And those memories we've created together in travel, they're even better than we thought. Remember that restaurant where you'd never felt so full? Know that when you paid your bill, you helped feed your waiter's family of four. And that time you stared open-mouthed at that incredible dance. You maintain jobs that keep important cultures and traditions alive. Travel is not just life-changing. Travel is world-changing, too. That photo you took on safari, the one that hit new levels of likes, your trip supported the tireless fight against the illegal wildlife trade. Remember that spontaneous city break? It helped maintain schools in the local area. And your tour guide, the one who made you laugh so much, she is one of millions of women employed in a sector leading in gender equality. Remember how you made a difference when you traveled? Remember how much your travels meant to others? Now, just think of all the good you can do in the future. Travel the world. Make a world of difference. And a very warm welcome to this, day two of the virtual summit, brought to you by the ITIC, the International Tourism and Investment Conference in partnership with WTM Africa, under the title of Invest, Rebuild and Restart the African Tourism Sector. I'm Rajan Datta, a broadcaster and journalist specialising in all things to do with travel and tourism, and it is my great honour to be moderating today. Now, I said yesterday, and I will say it again, if we were looking at one region of the world which holds the greatest potential and biggest opportunities in terms of tourism, it is surely the incredibly uh, diverse and exciting continent of Africa. But the whole world is, let's face it, facing some obstacles to speedy recovery at the moment. And we will, we will be tackling those issues today, too. We have a packed agenda ahead of us with sessions looking at the economic outlook, of course, assessing the state of play of vaccines and testing and how tourism is severely dependent on the equitable and global distribution of vaccines and the need for universally agreed protocols. We'll look at how investment in, Af in Africa's tourism industry is being evaluated by the major stakeholders and players, state governments, city government, investors themselves, and by influential organizations like the Commonwealth that can help boost investment. But before we proceed, I want to get some introductory thoughts from our conference organizers. So let me turn first to Dr. Taleb Rifai, who's the chairman of uh, ITIC and former Secretary General, you know him, uh, of the UNWTO. Taleb, hello. Hello, good morning. Am I heard well? My voice is good. Your voice is excellent, as ever. Um, tell me, Thank you. yesterday at the ministerial panel, there was this kind of um, agreement that there needs to be a coming together of all the tourism ministers. Now, is this something that, that can happen? Do you think that the ITC can get involved in? ITIC? Of course. Of course. It must happen. It's the only way out. We cannot work this. We cannot face this as each individual government on its own. We have to work together, not just ministers of tourism, ministers of health, ministers of finance, and ministers of transportation, wildlife. They all must come to together. I think we must work together with the AU. African Union to do it. We must do it. There's no other way. We must put all the ministers in a room and tell them you cannot leave this room until you agree. That's the way to do it. Okay. And there's, and there's a concrete proposal to do that. We, you, you will That's right. do that. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Now, what we also heard yesterday is from some ministers in the panel was that um, we can't really be thinking about investment until COVID is, un is under control, until vaccinations and testing protocol are globally agreed. Do you agree with that? Or can we discuss investment now? Depends what type of investment. Investments in tourism per se, no. 
can't build more hotels now, but we can build infrastructure, period. Infrastructure to serve, not just tourism, to serve other things in life. Let's remember, in the late 20s of last century, Roosevelt embarked on the building of highways in the United States in the middle of a, of a very deep depression, built all the highways that today we're using because that's what puts people to work and you need, you need it anyhow. So that's the kind of investment we're looking for, highways, airports. And uh, I think Najib Balala, our minister of Kenya, said something like that yes, yesterday. I completely agree with him. Okay. Thank you, Taleb. We're going to hear more from you uh, th throughout the day and obviously at the end of the day as well when we assess how the uh, okay. whole, whole day went. Um, I want to introduce uh, Ibrahim Ayoub, who is the CEO and MD of ITIC and Invest Tourism Limited. Um, hello, Ibrahim. Hello, Rajan. Hello, Taleb and Carol. Hi, hi. You. Hi. hi. Um, I want to ask you, what do you feel is the role of um, the ITIC in, in these testing times, Ibrahim? Yes. First of all, uh, I would like to, uh, before I answer this question, I would like to say uh, we are very proud to be working with WTN again. And, uh, and that partnership of two years, which we have forged, is continuing uh, very well, right? So uh, we have a lot of uh, good things to do in the future as well. So yes, Taleb, like Taleb, uh, uh, yes, Rajan and Taleb, like we, he rightly said, you know, uh, it's, it's a very challenging time at the moment, right? We passed through COVID for almost like a year now. We've been in lockdown, we open up again, we come back in lockdown, you know, like in the UK, when you take the example, we, we, we open up, then we experience the third wave, the second wave, then we gone in lockdown, but now look at a great example. The UK is doing well, I would say, because we got more than over 50% of our population vaccinated, right? We got now almost like 20% of the, of the population vaccinated with the second dose. And I think UK is going on the, on the right track. I, I think that's a good example. When you look about China, also is doing well, Australia, New Zealand, but other destinations that are doing well on the vaccination or on the way they have managed the COVID. I mean, lately, UK, I, I would say, in the, in, the good, uh, in the right track, right? And it's all going to depend on, on how the vaccination process goes on and how successful and the efficacy of all the vaccine which is being administrated in all the different destinations. And also that the vaccine are supplied on time because don't forget that now we are going in Q2, right? Q2, we are still having challenging times with a variant, new variant, double variant, mutated variant. So all that is being questionable. And that is certainly going to affect investment. Like uh, Minister uh, of Kenya rightly said, like Taleb uh, mentioned again, it's, I mean, nobody's going to go and invest in hotels, in big theme parks or or, uh, you know, water parks and so forth. So now it's a time to build on the infrastructure. And that's a little bit the role of ITIC, is to bring ideas, is to bring discussion, is to see how do we restart uh, the, 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 the travel and tourism sector once the, we, are, we are ready to, 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 to restart. But we need to, build, uh, to, to rebuild now. We need to think now. We need to plan now so that when we are ready to start, so then we can see all the different new projects and especially sustainable projects. Digitalization is becoming uh, very important in uh, throughout the whole value chain of the sector. So all that is quite uh, important. And tell me about the, the timetable of events to do with ITIC and African tourism this year. Because in a way, yesterday and today was a bit of a, a teaser, right? That's correct. That's correct. Because this, that's it. First, I mean, ITIC, I mean, since we started like two years ago, we, we started in London, then South, uh, Southeast Europe uh, in Bulgaria. We did in uh, uh, last year uh, our virtual for Middle East. But Africa is our real first, uh, I mean, e real event. We were supposed to do this live together with WTM, but unfortunately, we had to go uh, virtual again, but we hope in September we will be physical in Cape Town, right? So Africa is very important for us. And it, it, we have, it's a first of a series of free uh, conferences we are setting up. This is a teaser. This is the 
I mean, uh, the time we are doing, doing this first uh, event and we were going to have a second one in June and a physical one in person on the 1st to the 3rd of September in Cape Town. Wow. Right? Like, uh, like Taleb rightly said, we, are great. we will try to bring this ministerial, you know, <laughs> driving this ministerial panel uh, with all the African ministers together in Cape Town and all like yesterday, we had the EU, we had the Commonwealth, we had uh, Greece, and eventually today we will see the mayor of Malaga that would be with us. So that would like eventually to, uh, to collaborate with Africa and, 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 and to restart and you know, to, to work with Africa. That's, that's good news. And to tell you quickly that what we're going to do today, just after this morning conversation, we're going to have an interesting conversation uh, with, uh, AF, uh, with gentlemen from AFCTA, uh, the African Continental Free Trade Area. And then we will have, we'll hear from Afrexin Bank because we need to see what, what they will say. This is going to be moderated by uh, Rashid Toifi, who is a Deputy uh, Director General of the Western Cape uh, Government, right? And afterwards, we are going to hear from an interesting panel on the, um, uh, on the health, right? Because without health, like we say, uh, vaccination process, uh, we won't be able to open to open up, and we would be hearing from the minister of Cote d'Ivoire to see uh, what how he is uh, managing in Cote d'Ivoire, and afterwards hearing from epidemiologists, from expert in the health sector, and Tom Jones and David Heyman, the epidemiologist, who update us of the situation. We will have the a resilience panel, very interesting resilience panel, with uh, interesting. Um, uh, speakers like Edmund Bartlett, Minister of Jamaica, we would hear from Zambia, we will of WTTC, you know, and we will have the mayor of Malaga that is going to bring us the experience and best practices of Malaga, right? Afterwards, we're going to have a branding panel, interesting, because branding Africa as a single destination is very important, right? Because that's how uh, we will hear again from uh, Najib Balala from Minister of Kenya and Claire Akamunzi, uh, CEO of Rwanda, right? And then we have other panel, panelists like from Mauritius, uh, we'll hear from China uh, also, right? And we will have a panel uh, also about capital raising, which is important. So we'll hear from experts from, from the capital raising, from the people with the money, and from Africa at the same time, from the city of Cape Town and Western Cape government, their views, and the Commonwealth, and an investor from UK to tell us about his investment in Africa. Afterwards, we will have investment opportunities. I have to say that we have four projects that are going to be presented worth of over 3 billion US dollars, right? So we will hear from them and then we will close for the day. So that's a little bit of the program we are going to have today, Rajan. Okay, that's a packed program, no doubt about it. Um, I want to just quickly bring in now, um, to join us, Carol Weaving, who is the Managing Director of Reed Exhibitions in South Africa. Hello, Carol. Yeah, hi, morning, Rajan, how are you? I'm very, hi, Carol. Thank you. very excited about today as well. Um, tell hi. me, um, obviously a big player in, in kind of global travel conferences uh, around the world, all the year round. What's the WTM's perspective at the moment about the year ahead and how we progress? Yeah, I mean, obviously, in the ideal world, we'd love to be in Cape Town now, um, enjoying Cape Town hospitality, and, and I don't think you're ever going to replace the face-to-face the -face events. Um, but what is really important right now is that we continue with the virtual series, which is exactly what we're doing, because it is reigniting tourism. And I mean, just yesterday alone, we had over 2,000 meetings that have taken place between buyer and seller. Um, and we've been operating from 6 a.m. in the morning to 7 o'clock at night so that we can accommodate our friends from America's. Australasia. And I think, you know, it's really, really critical now that these conversations are happening because it's about the future and where are we, we going? And if you look at some of the content sessions that we've had, we've, we've talked about COVID recovery, of course. We've talked about diversity, LGBTQ+. We've had over 40 content sessions and people need this information and they're very hungry for content. So we don't want to just wait for the next live event. You know, we're here to offer 365 exposure. And I think opportunity to build those relationships that can in turn uh, turn into investment it's um 
nonetheless, for me, it's something I'm holding on to, which is that Cape Town in September will happen and that we will all meet and maybe even hug each other. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, you know, as Ibrahim mentioned and, and Talib, we are going to have a live event in the city in Cape Town in September. That's really exciting. But at the end of the day, you know, we really need to bring this content and this connections forward because at the end of the day, you know, we really want to look at future bookings. Um, and we've got so many experts that are actually able to join us online. And I'm afraid uh, virtual is going to be a thing of the future and not to replace the live event ever. It's going to be a complimentary thing. It's going to be it's going to add value to whatever you're doing in the live space. So we do really appreciate our partnership with the city of Cape Town, with IDC, with, of course, the International Tourism and Investment Conference, Ibrahim, thank you, um, and all of our partners. And, and I'm really excited that all these meetings are happening and people are genuinely doing business. Great. You're right, actually, with Zoom, it's going to be, there's going to be no excuse for not being at a conference. You can't pretend that you're, you're <laughs> just because you could be there virtually. Thank you, Carol. Um, OK, we have t time is running short. Um, let's turn uh, in a second to our first session, which is about the economic outlook, how to optimise investment opportunities in the tourism sector in Africa. And shortly, the Deputy Director General of the Department of Economic Development and Tourism of the Western Cape Government in South Africa, Rashid Tofi, will be speaking to you. So we'll be back in, in, in just a few seconds. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. Um, wonderful to be here today. I'm coming to you from the, the eastern coast of, of the Western Cape. And um, yeah, I just do wish we were we were in fact face to face. Um, I heard I heard the Secretary General or the, the um, Dr. Talib Rifai say we're going to meet together face to face, and I will certainly be your host when you when you come to the Western Cape. So I'm very excited to be here today. I think we we all understand the the devastation that that's happened in the tourism sector. What we're going to speak to today is we're going to get the view of a of the two economists around how investment is going to ensure that we have the the bounce back that we that we hope and expect after COVID. So I'm going to share very briefly. Take it will take us two or three minutes, a couple of slides, just to set the scene. Here we go. All right. So oops, let me just get to the top. There we go. So um, when, we, when we look at the tourism sector, I don't think the question is, can tourism bounce back and recover? The question is, how will it recover? It, it, we, we have no choice. It is the, the bread and butter for many countries. And it's, it's so crucial that post the pandemic, we see a, a bounce back of this crucial sector. And not just tourism as a sector for travelers, but the whole value chain that tourism creates in the economy. So just a quick reminder, um, one has to put into perspective that 10% of the global GDP, almost 9 trillion US dollars, was accounted for by travel and tourism prior, I'm going to say BC, before COVID. And 330 million jobs, one in every 10 jobs globally, um, have been tourism related. So, And tourism also has, out, has outpaced the rest of the global economy. When the rest of the economy in the last five years has grown by 2.5%, 3.5% was the rate of growth of the tourism sector. So it's and it's and so it's unfortunate that in a time when the global economy has come to a standstill, not only has tourism been the hardest hit, but it's also been the hardest to bounce back just because of the current restrictions. Um, I think we also mustn't underestimate what the postponement of large events like the, the Olympic Games or Wimbledon or something like the Cape Town International Jazz Festival or even the WTM conference that would have brought all of us to the shores of Cape Town, contributing to the to the GDP, just to see the movement. And those kind of events have a have a huge impact. So, a couple of important trends and changes post COVID in the in the world of tourism is that we will, of course, we have seen a huge capacity and inventory decline. We will see new health and safety regulations that simply fundamentally change the way people move. Um, and, and, and most importantly, I'd like to speak with our two colleagues today is how has the investment climate changed when we look at the tourism sector? But I think there are some cautious, we need, we can be cautiously optimistic. Um, I think there's a pent up desire amongst people for authentic original experiences and travel within Africa, both from outside of Africa to our continent and between destinations is what you cannot find that anywhere else in the world. You, sim you simply can't. And um, even the idea of people working from home and working while traveling, I think we've proved today, we all, all of us are sitting literally in different continents, different countries, and we can still operate and, and be functional. Um, so what, what's the outlook or the projections? We expect that after a, a huge decline, one of the biggest recessions our, our globe has ever experienced in the last at least the last 50 or 60 years, we expect that the GDP growth globally, or in Africa particularly, to be to be a positive 3.4% in the next year. Perhaps you can comment if you agree with me. The problem, however, is that many African countries are indebted, are highly indebted, and some of them are 10 to 15% have a debt to a ratio, uh, a debt to GDP ratio of 10 to 15%. And how is that going to impact on our ability to, to reinvest? So there are, of course, some downside risks. There's the, the possible resurgence of covert. Um, there's always the, the issue of social tension, security concerns. Um, 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 Ambassador Ojakal, I think you said in your, in your recent writings that you think security concerns are a real issue on our continent. But the upside, of course, is the deployment of vaccines. And um, we will hear from, from our colleague from Afrexim Bank what they're doing as a bank to actually make that kind of thing possible. And I think quite central to our conversation is this 
this, this fundamentally new approach, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, while it was for, formed three, two years ago, consummated three years ago, it really has only started this year. And the question is, is that will it, will it still achieve its full potential post-COVID? So I'm going to unshare my screen and I will start with my first colleague, um, someone who is has spent, yeah, so we have an economist, Mr. KC Lee, Kuang Wing, thank you very much for being here today. He's an economist, he's the chairman of Union Pay International Regional Council, and he sits on the board of various financial institutions, including Afrexum Bank. He's a, he has an, a BSc in economics from the School of, of, of Economics in, um, in London. And I'm, I'm not gonna read your full bio, sir, but uh, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. I think your perspective as a banker is, is interesting. So. Um, Welcome and welcome all the way from Mauritius, I believe. Good to have you here. Yeah, thank Casey. you. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, uh, good morning, everybody uh, from Mauritius. I mean, you you should know that Mauritius is heavily reliant on tourism. Twenty five percent of the GDP of the economy uh, uh, depends on tourism, and if you uh, consider all the uh, spillover of uh, industry in the economy and the linkages. I mean, you know, more than 50% of livelihoods of people depends on tourism. So it's a very tourism reliant economy. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, it's, it uh, puts sharply into focus the necessity of rebuilding and reinventing tourism for the very survival of the economy. So when you talk about the economic landscape in terms of uh, financing uh, requirement for rebuilding tourism, I mean, uh, we can start with the very uh, important decisions that every government had to take, which is to intervene very heavily with a central bank, with a large stimulus package, and also with all kind of assistance programs in order to save jobs, or at least to preserve livelihood of people. So we already have a lot of liquidity flowing around in the country. And I think generally within Africa, we are all inspiring ourselves from the European and the American uh, experiment where liquidity is being floated around through huge stimulus packages. And this liquidity uh, is best not to be wasted. So the first challenge that we are having is to make sure that this liquidity help to preserve at least sanity uh, and health within the population. This is the first priority. The second thing is there is less and less uh, uh, access to external financing these days because all everybody is being very protectionist. You can see it with a vaccine distribution and supply. So with a rising protectionism and uh, global recession taking hold, uh, we have heard of a timid uh, uh, recovery uh, from the global uh, perspective, 3.4% from what I've heard. But the IMF just today announced, or today or yesterday announced, that it's going to be a world growth of 6%. We have revised it upwards. So it means that vaccination is uh, having some effect uh, in the minds of the public at least. So in spite of all these uncertainties and all the volatilities going around in the world, there's still liquidity and there's still the will of government to find sources of finance and to raise the limit of the debt ceiling because it is a question of survival. But the problem is, it's not a question of building back the industry or even building it back better. The problem is having to reinvent tourism completely. That's a big challenge that everybody has because we can't go back to business as usual because we have to, trans to transcend this uh, 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 current situation in order to have a new economic and uh, business model, and a new tourism ecosystem. And this is where, for us in Africa, I think a, a, a deep and, and thorough overall have to be done 
with a whole of Africa approach, in an integrated approach, like what we have done in the vaccine uh, financing program at Afexim Bank. What we have done because we knew... Yes, I believe you've, you've, fund, you've funded 400 million doses of the vaccine. Tell us exactly. about that mechanism. Do you, has, do you regard that as a stimulus package to the economy? Or is that, how, how no, have you to, felt? It's unusual to yeah. see a bank step in and play yeah. such a role. I think it's very, it's, it's very commendable yeah. to see that. Exactly. We are leveraging a bit on the experience that we had in the, uh, in the past, especially with regard to the commodity crash. You know, there was, there was huge commodity uh, price, price uh, uh, declines in, within Africa. And also during the world recession, to the, during the 200 and 2008 financial crisis. So a lot of African governments were going on, under and we had to come to their rescue. So based on that experience, we have come up with a two-dimensional package. Number one is to make sure that we are not short of vaccines because we already foresee that there is going to be great nationalism taking place and the, the developed countries' manufacturing capacity will be used for their own interests. So we had the earmark a program which is called the Purchase uh, the Advanced Acquisition Program where AFREXIM has launched uh, uh, a, a, a facility of $2 billion, $2 billion in order to guarantee the pre-orders of all African states and to make sure there's an affordable and there's a, a fairer distribution of vaccines all over Africa. So the Afrexim stand as guarantee to all these governments who have been uh, pre-ordering the vaccines all, of, all over the place to make sure that the manufacturers is uh, guaranteed that payment will be effected once it is being supplied. This is the first dimension, which is a, uh, a vaccine acquisition program. The second program is what is called the trade mitigation, uh, the trade impact mitigation, because uh, this COVID has a severely, severely hit supply chain, has severely hit uh, regional trade, transport, logistics, and everything has been put, as you've just said, uh, into almost a standstill. So there was uh, the risk that there will be shortage of essential supplies. And uh, especially in this case of uh, a, glo a regional pandemic, Right. Uh, it was important to make sure that medical supplies, food supplies and um, essential uh, services are still uh, carrying on. So we earmark a package of five billion dollars through this uh, uh, pandemic uh, trade impact mitigation facility. And this facility was aimed at uh, four categories of beneficiaries. One is the government themselves to help them to to uh, buy vaccines and to uh, 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 buy essential uh, materials for the, the economic uh, uh, activities. Secondly, the uh, assistance was given to the central bank because uh, of a shortage of reserves. So we make sure that the central bank has the wherewithals to make payments, international payments, so that they are not dried of funds. And the third uh, uh, channel is through financial institutions. So all commercial banks which uh, were facing a liquidity or which were facing payments problem, so we came to the rescue and gave them the, the necessary uh, foreign currency in order that they can allow trade to continue. And the fourth dimension was directly to corporates. And uh, yes. uh, I've got directly to, to, to the firms themselves, because a lot of firms were totally in financial distress and uh, with a disruption in, in, uh, in distribution and in manufacturing, it was, uh, it was clear that a lot of uh, jobs were going to be lost and a lot of factories was going to go under. So we go directly into the funding of these uh, enterprises. So, Four Thank you, Casey. I've and, got to go uh, to the to our other yeah. to our okay. other. Um, <laughs> so, you. so thank you very much for that perspective, um, Commissioner Ojako. Please un unmute. I just wanted to say welcome. 
Commissioner is a, is he works at the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement. Thank you very much for being here, for stepping in for your SG, who's currently in a conversation, I believe, with a Namibian president. Um, you, um, um, Commissioner, you you said recently that um, the the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is not just a a trade agreement, but it's a developmental mechanism. Tell tell me a little bit about that view. Remember to unmute you. Yeah? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Rashid. Um, as, as we have always maintained, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting the Secretariat for this engagement. Uh, as you know, I'm stepping in a, a last minute for the Secretary General, who is actually right now in Southern Africa, but is engaged with the government of Namibia on the AFCFTA, the processes that are going on. Yes, indeed, the AFCFTA agreement is not just a trade agreement. It's a, a development instrument, a development instrument in the sense that uh, when you look at the objectives, you'll find uh, in the objectives under Article 3, we talk about the development of regional value chains and the development of industrialization within the continent. But beyond the objectives, um, the, the, the protocol on the trading services under which the tourism falls um, you know, uh, that is already open for, for negotiation. And tourism is one of the sectors that we have opened as a priority sector for countries to, to open up, you know, their tourism market uh, for negotiation. It's a development instrument because we're going to negotiate a protocol on investment, which then creates a, a single investment area in Africa so that... Uh, there is uniformity and there is, um, there is predictability in the investment environment in the continent. That's why we call it a, a development instrument. And it's going to catalyze um, other sectors. It's going to catalyze infrastructure, it's infrastructure development. It's going to catalyze the interconnectivity in terms of uh, the power networks, the, the energy networks within the continent because you cannot talk industrialization unless you have sufficient energy. Now in the continent, you realize there are countries that have surplus energy and there are countries that are in deficit energy. Now we are saying that if we are talking industrialization, then we need to have an interconnected grid in the continent uh, for energy so that those that are in deficit energy can receive from those that have surplus energy. Now, infrastructure, the, the, the west must connect to the east and the north must connect to the south. Um, and then air transport networks, uh, that you must make it easier for Africans to travel because there is a separate protocol on the movement of business persons. That also was, um, I think, has signed uh, sometime before the, 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 the FCFT agreement was signed. So it's a development instrument. It's going to catalyze the development of regional value chains. It's going to catalyze industrialization. It's going to catalyze increased production. Um, oh, oh, we know that COVID has definitely had a, a great impact and a big impact on Africa. But it's also opened our, um, our, our thinking that because the, 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 what, the, the supply chains were terribly interrupted by the COVID, so all of a sudden we realized we were over relying on countries for, for example, the supply of pharmaceutical products. Now we have a thinking across the continent that we need to do the pharmaceutical, the pharma sector is taking proactive action to ensure that the pharmaceutical industry in the continent is upscaled to be able to address any emergencies that will come. COVID will not probably be the last pandemic. There may be another one coming up. And I think the WHO has said we should begin to prepare for the next one. And I don't know when the next one will be. And that means that we must, as a continent, begin to address some of the challenges that are there. We know the tourism has been hit by about 30%, um, 30% drop in tourism earnings around the continent. Many countries in the continent rely on tourism. Mauritius, South Africa, you know, uh, in many Kenya, for example, Kenya is is... It has been a big tourism destination, but because of COVID, now everything is down. Uh, the travel sector, the, the, the conference tourism, the mice, you know, is, is gone down because of the COVID. But we do hope that um, 
with uh, the, you know, with, as we begin to adapt to the situation, as the vaccinations rise, that we will probably get back, but it won't be uh, at the levels of the pre-COVID period. We'll probably not get tourism to the same levels at the pre-COVID period, um, especially in the area of meetings, events, conferences, and so on. Because now what we are doing this morning is going to be a common feature for meetings in the future, uh, except well, where it is you, absolutely you practically. necessary for us to... Yes. How, how close are we to having real movement of people uh, facilitated by the trade agreement, the, the idea of a single passport or, or open borders? So we, have, we just have three minutes to wrap up, and that's why I just wanted that view. And then I'll come back to Casey. Unfortunately, we have very little time. You can give me your closing remarks. So, um, yeah, Commissioner, I, I think what, how close what, are we to such practical steps? Um, we know the concept of the free trade agreement, but are we close to getting such practical things, making it possible for physical movement? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what we have done now is to bring, uh, we've had uh, the customs administrations come together uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that, you know, the borders, um, you know, we have harmonized customs uh, clearance procedures uh, across the continent. That's the first thing. Now, in terms of the movement, the, the African passport is not something that is new. It's been there. It was launched by President Kagame, I think, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and so the African passport is there. It's uh, now a rolling out to the member yes. states. How do we make so it happen? They, yes, yes, yes. So the, the practical steps are there. We are activating them, the instruments that are within the FCFT agreement to ensure that there is free movement of goods and, and the persons that will be moving the goods across the border. That means that you have you know, truck drivers and so on. Those should have a free access across the border. And then many countries yeah. are moving, uh, and this is not really our, our part in terms of the FCFTA, the immigration. But many countries are now adopting uh, for the Africa visa on arrival. I have been to a number of countries and many of them are saying visa on arrival. Mauritius, Ghana, Uganda, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, all of them are visa on arrival, including Ethiopia now, which is the headquarters of the African Union. Absolutely. Casey, can I come back to you just for one minute, just to wrap up? So what's your outlook? I mean, I think you as you've shown that there's liquidity and, and there's enough money. What's your outlook in terms of when we, we bounce back and you see that movement? Just one, one minute as a closing yeah. wrap up. Yeah, my biggest concern is that uh, recovery might be uneven and asynchronous, meaning that yes. there will be a big divide between those who are more developed and those who are less developed. So this is one problem that we may be facing. So for this reason, I think Africa should look and focus a lot on the rebound of tourism in terms of SMEs, because tourism will, will uh, be totally different, you know, and move to a new business model. So SMEs, local participation, community partnerships, this is going to play a very big role in tourism, and I think, uh, financing okay. should be focused into these things. We don't need to uh, bother too much about the big boys and the big groups mm. and others. Let's focus on women, on local communities, on SMEs. And this is where the diaspora also can play a big role because they understand Africa. They come from Africa and they know how if we reinvent tourism, if we rebuild tourism, it should be on new Based on those foundations things. and Thank new you. relationships. Thank you, Casey. Um, and, and Commissioner Ojakal, thank you for joining us. I mean, uh, how do we make sure, just your last remarks, we've, we've got, we, we have an African heading up the WTO. How do you make that count? Just 30 seconds as a closing remark, please. You're, you're, please unmute. I'm, I'm not hearing you. We can't hear you. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Yes. I, 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 I was saying that... Uh, I prefer to focus on um, what we are doing under the FCFTA. <laughs> the WTO is one huge, uh, you know, elephant out there. But we want to deal with what is within our reach, which is the FCFTA. Because we begin to show the world, the, 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 the WTO has for long, um, I, I don't know, a lot of things are on a stalemate. But Africa is showing the way that regional integration can work, and we believe that the multilateral system can work. We are showing the multilateral system
that there is a way to do things. And that is what we are doing in Africa. And we do hope that the, the WTO will work with us in order to advance the agenda at a multilateral level. Well, thank you very much. We look forward to your leadership and for you showing us the way. Um, thank you very much, uh, KC. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Commissioner Ojako. It's been wonderful to speak to you and we could, we could have had another hour, but I'm gonna hand back now to Rajan Data for the next session. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us and take thank care. Thank you, Rashid. Bye -bye.
Welcome back. And thank you, Rashid, and your guests. That was absolutely fascinating. And some of those issues will definitely be recurring throughout uh, today. Um, let's go to our next session now, which is basically asking how the vaccination process will contribute to restore trust and a sense of security to restart the travel and tourism industry. Now, it does go without saying that having the most precise an informed appreciation of the health issues and the way out of the pandemic is critical, obviously, as we've noticed already, in investment decisions being made in the travel sector. We have three excellent guest perspectives. Um, we have the Honourable Tiendunu uh, Fofano, who's the Minister of Tourism from Côte d'Ivoire. He'll be speaking in French and being translated. Uh, that's a country that has declared a big push to make tourism a central plank of the Ivorian economy by 2025. And I also believe that the minister has just been reappointed. So congratulations for that. Um, we are hoping that Professor David Heyman, uh, who is an expert and professor of infectious disease epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine will join us. He's a former WHO assistant uh, director general in terms of health. And he's also just been to South Africa uh, to aid with the uh, efforts there. Um, we also have joining us, and I'm very pleased to welcome him back, uh, Tom Jones, the senior partner from Finn Partners, and he specializes in communications in healthcare. Um, now, just a bit of context, despite initial fears that the virus would ravage Africa, the, the continent has remained surprisingly one of the least impacted in terms of infections. Uh, there are some notable exceptions, uh, South Africa, for example, and some of the North African countries. They have had a few uh, issues with a high number of infections and deaths, sadly. Uh, but in general, Africa remains fairly lucky to be spared the worst. But today, there are still uncertainties around variants, around efficacy and distribution, and the manufacture of vaccines. Uh, there are, of course, issues around possible side effects, uh, and then, of course, on agreed global protocol for testing and immunity certification in travel. Huge, big issues. Um, let me turn to the minister first. Um, welcome to, to the session. Now, you did announce a big tourism strategy in 2025. Uh, obviously, that's been affected to a certain extent. Um, you want 5 million visitors, or you stated you did by 2025, uh, but the pandemic has seen apparently a 70% drop in hotel bookings. So basically what I wanted to ask you first is, can you explain about the management of the pandemic in Côte d'Ivoire? How have you gone about that? Okay. Merci beaucoup. Euh, disons que cette pandémie qui touche le monde entier, euh, la pandémie à coronavirus, pour la Côte d'Ivoire, nous avons eu la chance de n'avoir pas été suffisamment impacté. Chose euh, qui permet aujourd'hui de dire que la Côte d'Ivoire, c'est un peu plus de 44 000 personnes qui ont été infectées, dont 43 400 personnes ont été guéries. Et nous enregistrons, durant toute cette période de la pandémie, un peu plus de 257 morts. 257 morts, comparé aux chiffres des pays euh, où la pandémie a sévi, on peut dire que ça a été contenu dans une proportion relativement euh, maîtrisée. Cependant, la Côte d'Ivoire ne s'est pas arrêtée en si bon chemin. Il y a des mesures préventives qui ont été prises visant à faire en sorte qu'il y ait des mesures barrières qui soient intensifiées. Euh, le port des masques, le lavage des mains avec euh, les produits hydroalcooliques et bien naturellement euh, la distanciation sociale. Ce sont des questions qui ont été prises à cœur par le gouvernement et moi-même j'avais été investi de la mission de construction des infrastructures, de dépistage et d'isolement de, euh, euh, des personnes contacts ceux qui ont été en contact avec des personnes infectées. C'est toutes ces mesures que nous avons prises et pour les malades, les loger quand ils sont dans des conditions de vie qui peuvent être un facteur de contamination. Il fallait rompre la chaîne de contamination. Et c'est ce que le gouvernement de Côte d'Ivoire s'est vertu à faire. Et ça fonctionne quand même bien. Aujourd'hui, nous enregistrons mille et quelques cas. Mais nous avons connu une vague. C'est ce qui a fait que nous sommes passés de 120 morts à 254 morts aujourd'hui. 
Uh, Minister, I'm just going to interrupt you so that you can be translated, uh, if possible, by uh, the translator, Joseph. Thank you. Okay. Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, just want to summarize what the minister said. Um, he said that the following the, the, the outbreak of the pandemic and the early days, the government has really uh, take, they, taken this uh, seriously and uh, they developed some strategies to, um, I mean, prevent the, I mean, the, the large expansion of these virus out, I mean, all over the country. Therefore, uh, he was even engaged uh, it was even uh, in involved in the implementation of some uh, um, isolation uh, infrastructure to um, prevent the outbreak of, I mean, this, the largest nation of this uh, 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 virus all over the country. And uh, the country has been um, uh, fortunate enough because up to now, uh, we have... Uh, Um, for uh, 44,000 people infected and 43 and 400,000 people cured. So this I mean, sets, for, um, sets for how the um, pandemic has been uh, seriously taken uh, into account by the government for putting uh, in place some precaution measures like uh, uh, the social distances, um, the worry of mass and um, I mean vast um, program of sensitization of the population about the the danger of this virus. So today, um, um, it has been serious because um, we were uh, having one hundred twenty thousand deaths but we moved to 257 uh, deaths today. So this is, it shows how serious this virus is uh, in the country. But measures have been taken uh, to really um, prevent, I mean, to work against that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Just, just one more question for the time being, which is that, there is an issue with, with production of vaccines because a lot of people have said, well, hang on a second, Europe is making its vaccines, India is making vaccines, China is making vaccines, um, you know, it's, it's obviously the United States are. Isn't it time really for the continent to come up with a plan to set up at least two or three production plants, vaccine production plants, uh, to supply the continent and produce its own vaccines? What do you say to that, Minister? Monsieur le ministre, la question qui vous est posée, c'est de savoir que aujourd'hui, il y a l'Europe qui produit ce vaccin, il y a la Chine euh, et d'autres continents, d'autres pays qui sont engagés dans la production des vaccins efficaces à la lutte contre la pandémie. Euh, N'est-ce pas un grand temps pour l'Afrique éventuellement de pouvoir aussi euh, penser à mettre en place des infrastructures de sorte à pouvoir euh, créer euh, son propre vaccin pour pouvoir euh, éventuellement euh, venir à, à bout de cette pandémie au niveau continental de l'Afrique. Quel est votre avis euh, sur ce point? Et naturellement, euh, la question qui se pose aujourd'hui dans le cadre de COVAX, euh, c'est vrai que nous bénéficions de la pure euh, des pays les plus avancés, mais au regard du rythme auquel nous avançons, nous pensons que s'il devrait avoir euh, un passeport sanitaire et lié euh, au vaccin, l'Afrique euh, va beaucoup piétiner et nous serons en retard parce que aujourd'hui, quand on fait le point en Côte d'Ivoire, nous sommes à environ à 53 000 personnes vaccinées sur une, une totale population de 30 millions. Il va sans dire que la question de production de vaccins se pose avec beaucoup d'acuité au niveau du continent africain. Et ce d'autant puisque l'Afrique a la chance d'avoir une population jeune, euh, en général pour la Côte d'Ivoire et pour bien des pays de l'Afrique subsaharienne, c'est une population d'environ 70 
qui ont moins de 35 ans. C'est en même temps une chance d'avoir à épargner une bonne partie de nos populations, ce qui explique que nous sommes moins atteints. Mais la question de la production de vaccins se pose en des termes beaucoup plus sérieux. Alors, la proposition, en tant que membre du gouvernement, nous pensons que nos gouvernements devraient faire un effort pour mutualiser les aides sous l'égide de l'Union africaine à l'effet de mettre un laboratoire pour toute l'Afrique et faire en sorte de produire pour l'Afrique pour que nous ne manquions pas à ce rendez-vous parce que si on doit attendre sept ans, ça sera beaucoup plus grave. Thank you, Minister. I need uh, to get Joseph to give a chance to translate that. Uh, Joseph, please, over to you. Yeah, the Minister is saying that uh, um, uh, Africos is uh, benefiting a lot in the, uh, in the program, in the COVID program, uh, which is uh, good. And, and also it will, it will definitely be a, a very uh, difficult, very difficult for Africa when it comes to the uh, health passports to be put in place because um, it's, a, it's a serious issue. And uh, given that um, we, Africa up to now, I mean, uh, sorry, in Africa, for example, uh, for the time being, uh, it's only 53,000 people that have benefited from the vaccine out of and, and 30 million people as a population, which is, uh, which is uh, very, very uh, less uh, in terms of, if, I mean, effectiveness. So meanwhile, Africa is quite lucky for having uh, a young population, which is less than um, 35 years old, which is, uh, which is something very uh, important to consider and in terms of infection and but however, um, the production of vaccine is something important. Therefore, um, all the African continents are really called upon to come together and, and mutualize the aids for construction, you know, constructing um, some um, facilities to produce, to produce sorry, um, the vaccine that will really benefit for the whole continent. So heads has to be federated and, and see how best this can assist the whole continent. That's, that's a stake. Thank you, Minister, for the moment. We will come back to you. Um, on that, on one of the points you raised there, I want to go to Tom, uh, Tom Jones from Finn Partners. Um, the fact that Africa is obviously in many ways and unfortunately lagging behind in terms of the number of vaccinations, when we talk about travel and global travel, I mean, what's the score here? What's the issue? Do you think everybody needs to be vaccinated before we can really get back to, to, to normal or what? Well, it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> Some of the business owners that uh, I spoke to earlier this week uh, in Africa uh, tell me that they're more optimistic than you might that they might have you that you might believe otherwise from what you see in the news and and based on the statement that you just made Rajan. um so i think that uh you know when you google travel in africa the you get pages and pages of safaris and we all know that uh, uh outdoor transmission risk with COVID is very low um and the psychographics of the type of people who are going to those types of uh vacations or uh, 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 travel destinations are by nature just a little bit more adventurous anyway. But what I'm hearing in in, in large part and what we're all observing um, when it comes to Africa is mostly that it's, it. of course, vaccinations are very important. And you're right, Africa is behind the curve a little bit. Um, but it's really about the coordination and the collaboration and the communication that's going to really reinstill confidence here with people coming particularly from western parts of the world into africa to uh, uh to get to where they can feel a sense of trust um because it's it's the testing it's it's the uh reassurance um that transmission risk will be low when they get there and that quarantine measures are in place so i think that it really it really does come down to communications and reassurance but absolutely 
vaccines are going to be playing a big or will continue to play a big part of that. In, but in terms of protocol, in terms of communication and reassurance, it does feel all a bit messy at the moment. And obviously, it's a big job to try and get the whole world to, 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 to coordinate and to, and to be to conform, if you like. How, do, how what do you see the pathway forward in terms of reestablishing travel uh, to, to at least some degree in the next six months? Say? Well, I think it's three things. I think it's the sort of the and I think that Africa is unique in that there are so many different internal measures that they just need to make on the continent alone. Um, so I would say it comes down to three things, safe resumption of cross-country travel within Africa alone, restoring confidence in tourism and hospitality. And then also something that you and I have talked about before is curbing the impact of misinformation. And, on, and, and it's really on that last point, Rajan, that I think is particularly important because you know, as with many parts of the world, mistrust for vaccines, mistrust for any type of uh, public health policy is 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 ubiquitous. Um, misinformation fuels all sorts of significant levels of, of, of mistrust, particularly with Western medicines, and that's due in large part to historical mistrust of Western medicines in Africa. But um, and there's been some uh, speculation about the effectiveness of, of vaccines and um, alongside misinformation of vaccines. And I think that that's, that's going to be playing uh, a big part of that. So, you know, for me, it really does come down to some of the measures, you know, to your question about collaboration and coordination. I think that messages need to be tailored um, to suit specific audiences, um, address barriers, and really put to work some of the enablers in these specific local markets to ensure that they're relevant and ending to ensure that the public health um, education initiatives are relevant and engaging. Um, and I think that to the to your point about collaboration and coordination, um, partnerships between tourism sec, uh, stakeholders and vaccine safety, safety stakeholders really should be established to ensure um, coordinated uh, information sharing and dissemination. Um, it's just so important. Effective communication and public education uh, will I believe help mitigate ultimately resistance to uh, vaccines um, uh, and and onboarding those types of initiatives. Uh, Covax has done an amazing job in that regard, but it's still at the nascent stages. Just on the disinformation angle, we have a very live issue at the moment, and it's quite an interesting test case for you, I suppose, which is that um, the AstraZeneca virus is being uh, that there are a few uncertainties. Yes, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Yeah. 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 Um, how do you, I mean, how can we make sure that doesn't turn into a campaign of disinformation? <laughs> facts, right? I mean, making sure that we have the facts is really uh, incredibly uh, important here. And it, uh, you don't see uh, hashtag facts matter for, uh, a, you know, for no reason at all. And each of these companies really are doing, I think, an amazing job. I think AstraZeneca has had some early, you brought up AstraZeneca, they've had some early hurdles that they've had to overcome. Johnson & Johnson just came out and there were some questions about the efficacy of that in comparison to the other two, Moderna and Pfizer, which was unfair because the, you can't look at these things in a head-to-head -head basis. The clinical trials were not designed for that and they were also designed during different times of the year when there were different variants or different populations being uh, tested and uh, you know, the viral loads were different. So it's, it's, it's just not, you can't look at it that way. So it just puts the onus more on not only the industry, but it's really, especially on the industry, but also, and why they hire guys like us, but also why, you know, it's really with collaboration and coordination with WHO, the Africa CDC, the U S CDC and other organizations in the EMEA to really help, ensure that the public information is trusted but it also must be consistent because there's a lot of inconsistency out there and there's different people putting out different pieces of information and we just we need to have a viral overload of ourselves of information that's accurate accurate and factual to really overcome some of those barriers that you've just brought up thank, thank you now i see that dr Heyman has joined us uh, hello dr Heyman. how are you if you unmute. Yes, I will. Thanks. Sorry, I had some difficulty joining earlier. 
That's okay. Now, you are, as far as we're concerned, the, you know, the, 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 the best expert we can possibly get on this panel to talk about this. I know you've been to South Africa recently advising there about uh, vaccination and, 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 and uh, curbing the, the infections. What's the latest state of play? If you can just give us a, a roundup as to how you see things proceeding when it comes to, the, the, to COVID and the vaccination process. You know, um, since we're talking about travel and about vaccinations, um, what's important is that first of all, governments are engaged in wanting to vaccinate their people and getting the vaccines out to people. So that's important. If COVAX facility, for example, gives vaccines to a country, then the country must be able to provide the commitment they need to get those vaccines to the people who need them. So once we see that vaccines are being distributed in countries, there will be a great reassurance that things are on track. But what will eventually happen, in my view, is that as countries uh, that are using vaccines in industrialized countries in particular, see that death and disease are decreasing, they will be more confident in how they make policies moving forward. Right now, countries are looking for equal risk in order that they can begin travel between their country and another country. They want to see that that country has an equal risk of transmission. And once they begin to see that, travel will ease up much more than before. We've seen some attempts to ease up travel between Singapore and Hong Kong, for example, in December last year. But once transmission increased in one of those countries, they stopped that moving forward. So what we need to see is, is confidence building, as Tom said earlier, trust in countries that they're doing all they can to control disease. But remember also that vaccines are also a personal protective issue. And people who are traveling may want to get the vaccine in order to travel safely as they do for yellow fever, for example. I'm hearing, um, I think somebody, uh, the economist mentioned it earlier on, this whole notion of another pandemic coming soon. I mean, what do you, what do you say to that? Is that well, you possible? know, we know that there are risks now uh, from antimicrobial resistance, for example. So if there's a major outbreak of anti-resistant organisms that begins to spread around the world, that could cause a pandemic of resistant infections. We don't anticipate that that will happen, but we have to be ready in case it does. And of course, we have to be ready for other respiratory pathogens should they emerge, as did this coronavirus, and spread around the world. You know, infections come regularly from the animal kingdom into humans. HIV came, it's now endemic. Um, other infections have come, other coronaviruses have come from the animal kingdom. There are four that are now endemic. So we can anticipate that there will be more. And we just have to have learned from this pandemic how to be better prepared. Um, I don't want to be too gloomy about this. And I, I want to leave with, with a positive uh, message, really, which is, you know, if everything goes okay, you know, as according to, to plan over the next few months, how do you, I'm not expecting you to be a futurologist, but how do you, how do you expect to see travel beginning on a, on a bigger scale? Well, what it will take is confidence of countries that their people can travel safely and come back without infection. That's what's required. WHO will not play a role in that because WHO can only provide a framework that countries can use for risk assessment. But they will not be able to say it's safe to travel to this country or to another country. That will be the, the responsibility of governments moving forward in making the alliances that they can make to make sure that travel is safe. I think the airlines will play a major role in that, in making sure that travel is safe and that people who are traveling are not infected. But again, it's all about confidence building and trust in each other that countries will be able to move ahead. But there will be no one formula for that. It will be individual countries working with others to make sure that they understand the risk is equal so they can travel there and come back safely. So we're talking kind of bilateral agreements rather than a universal one. Bilateral or multilateral regional agreements will be what probably will occur. But much of that depends on what significance we see from the variants of the virus that are of concern right now. Because if those variants do not escape vaccine, as we believe they're not doing, then that will give even more confidence to countries that travel can resume. 
David, um, Minister for Fana and Tom Jones, thank you so much. I wish we had so much more time to discuss this. This is such a pressing issue. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions that the audience has, but um, thank you so much for your time. And we'll all cross fingers and hope that we will all meet in person soon. Thank you. you we'll back. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And we'll be back quite soon. With Welcome back. Now, this particular session will attempt to get down to the nuts and bolts of where investment opportunities lie and what needs to be done to increase the attractiveness of African countries to encourage more and of the right type uh, of, of investment. Uh, in my view, in our industry, Africa and tourism will come into focus in very sharp, into very sharp focus as we emerge, hopefully, out of the pandemic crisis soon. So I think we should be talking on that level. Um, my distinguished guests bring their own specialist expertise to the discussion, particularly from the perspective of the areas of the Commonwealth and South Africa. They are Ian Little Granger, who's MP and chair of the UK Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and recently appointed vice chair of the Commonwealth. We have Mobin Rafiq, who is chairman of Falcon House Properties uh, UK and founder and CEO of the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club. And we'll be finding out a little bit more about that. We also have Il Ilsa uh, Van Schalkwijk, and forgive me if, if the pronunciation isn't perfect, um, the Chief Director for Economic Sector Support Western Cape. Uh, and we also have, um, as a last minute change, uh, Dr. Tienz Vivian, uh, thank you for stepping in, uh, who is the Head Destination Development Place at Marketing Cape Town. He's replacing uh, Alderman James Voss. Welcome to you all. Um, thanks for... Uh, for um, in being here and some of those titles are quite quite incredible aren't they? Um, <laughs> but I want to start with Cape Town um, and with you Ilsa because you have some observations don't you to make about the investment climate at the moment particularly as it's affecting you in South Africa and the Western Cape. 
Thank you very much, Rajan. So, yes, um, I work for provincial government, so it's very much in terms of a regional for the Western Cape. And in terms of our experience over the last year, it's definitely been a shift with regards to the investment climate. Um, and it's not just unique to South Africa, but definitely in terms of the Western Cape perspective, what we're seeing is in terms of shifts has been the move um, from tourism being classified as a high risk investment opportunity. So businesses are currently struggling um, to access capital uh, due to the fact that the demand for the business in terms of the current ban on travel for, for um, different countries and in South Africa's uh, perspective, very much with regards to being seen as a high risk country during um, in relation to the what they refer to as the SA variant with regards to the current COVID strain has really placed a big strain on another word of strain on South Africa and our SMEs being able to access formal financing. So it's, um, and we've seen that shift over the last 12 months. Um, in the beginning, COVID, there was a lot of relief funding available to try and get businesses over that, that hump in terms of just securing their cash flow. But as the, the, the months increased and as the period um, lengthened with regards to the businesses not being able to trade because there was just not enough visitors coming to, to the Western Cape, and in the Western Cape in particular, we're quite reliant on international travel, we've seen um, a cease in relation to many commercial real estate developments. So from a construction side, there's definitely been a slowdown with regards to the activity. Um, many companies are unsure with regards to spending. Um, and as we go into wave, we went through wave one and two, and we, we survived the second wave in South Africa pretty decently. But the third wave, of course, and that perception of risk has really placed the, and I understand that, but the financial institutions are seeing it as a, as a high risk investment. So from a small business perspective, from a commercial, from the bigger, the larger firms, there's, there's, um, it's not as easy to raise capital, whether it's from a private equity perspective or the formal financing to, with regards to just managing and, um, your cash flow. So there's definitely been a shift in South Africa with regards to the, the availability of, of financing. When it comes to, to big finance from the international uh, sector, I mean, and private equity in particular, where do, I mean, how much do you get of that, if you like? I mean, how, where does it come from in terms of, of, of the Cape, Western Cape? So in terms of that, we've got a pretty solid investment pipeline, which we, which we monitor. Um, the majority of the investment currently for tourism with regards to foreign direct investment sits um, probably in the real estate um, sector. So you would see a lot of where there's been a shift with regards to new investment, shifts are occurring in terms of expansion opportunities. And currently, um, the, there wasn't too many, um, how can I say, companies that withdrew. They, they, they did just tentatively pause their expansion operations. So from a foreign direct investment perspective, the landscape is changing in terms of that the volume of queries, the volume of investment leads are slowing down. Um, which is a risk, and I don't think that's just in from a Western Cape or South African perspective. Um, I think that's a global shift because the risks is a similar risk that any other country or financier would consider. Um, Dr. Vivian, if I can turn to you, do you, do you echo a lot of what uh, Ilse says there? Is that the experience that you're having on, on a city level? Um, tell me what, 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 the, what the state of play is there with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Rajan, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, much in agreement, um, we an integrated city with the uh, hinterland of our province. But what we've seen is that there's great interest still in Cape Town as an investment destination. So during the pandemic 2019-2020 period, uh, we landed about 11.6 billion rands of investment in Cape Town. Now, that was predominantly in manufacturing, but also very importantly in the BPO sector. So we've seen a lot of uh, call centers being erected, people working online. So the change is there, but the interest is still, is still with Cape Town. Um, we also positioned as a ICT startup hub uh, in Africa, and that's boded well for us during this period. We know it's challenging times. Um, but I think the, the pre-COVID growth rate is, is waiting to, to re-emerge and we positioned quite well to, to take up those opportunities. What about hotels? What about the classic 
uh, travel and tourism uh, stock, if you like, that you, that you need in a city like yours? What, what's the state to play with that? Well, we have a few hotels that are in process of expanding and also new hotels being built in Cape Town. So I think people are looking at the longer play and saying there, there is opportunity in Cape Town. There were very good growth figures prior to the pandemic. But our challenge as a city government is to build uh, destination confidence. And I think that's Africa's challenge. We need to build destination confidence. Why would people come here? We know they come here for the attractions. They come here for the experience. What are the things that deter them from coming? COVID is the thing at the moment. So how do we combat that? If I'm in the destination as a tourist and I do contract the virus, what will happen to me? Will there be sufficient facilities available? So coping with the second and the third uh, wave is crucial in building that uh, confidence for the destination. But we've bounced back uh, previously and we're confident to do that again. Well, thank you. We'll return to, to, to both of you and talk about the, the, the Cape and Cape Town issue and the Western Cape issue as well. Uh, I want to turn to Mobin. Now, Mobin, you have two hats, if you like. You are uh, part of an investment consortium, if that's the right word. Uh, but you're also uh, the kind of head of the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club. So before I ask you about the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club, should we watch a quick video of uh, telling us a little bit about it? So there we have it, maybe. It's, it's, it's a good video. It, it outlines <laughs> what the club does. But I, I, I need to ask you, I mean, some people might think the Commonwealth, uh, an anachronism, um, perhaps not relevant to 21st century Africa. W what do you say to that? I think uh, it is more relevant now, especially after uh, UK taking a stand on Brexit. So now we are back into Commonwealth. And I think uh, another advantage is that what Commonwealth used to be, 
30 years ago, but things have changed. So Commonwealth is not poor, Commonwealth is rich, full of minerals, resources. So I think it's a, and then it's a huge population. So I think uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a good start and uh, great expectations and uh, good timing in a sense because the industry needs collaborations, industry needs uh, joint ventures. So I think uh, I personally look at it, it's the right time. And uh, especially after this COVID, it becomes more because now we need to interact with each other and, and Commonwealth advantages, we, we know each other. It's uh, mainly it's uh, English-speaking is, is countries. And uh, uh, UK is still a very big brand. So I think uh, loads of SMEs in UK, I mean, the main idea of Commonwealth Entrepreneur Club is to uh, create opportunities for SMEs. Because you know SMEs are very important because 80, 85% of the uh, SMEs in each and at any country in Commonwealth consist 85%, which is which is a big number, and uh, that's where we thought. But the advantage we have right now is that this time, what we are trying, we want Commonwealth to take the private sector lead instead of doing concentrating, taking government, taking more uh, weight. Uh, through government, I think the easiest way, the only way, because you know we already tried last 30, 40, 50 years, but I personally feel that, especially my background, my family background from the industry, so I personally believe that without the private sector, we won't be able to make a headway. So now I think, uh, and I really don't need to convince because most of the important people, especially Excellency Ian Little Gretcher, you know, uh, I, I forgot to congratulate him, so I, I want to do that first. But I mean, this this is important. So I think uh, everyone I've uh, been watching the last few years in UK is convinced that it's the private sector which has to take uh, uh, the responsibility because mm-hmm. it, it's more faster. Because you see, end of the day, what happens is uh, in Commonwealth, you know, every two three years, one year, you know, they all meet. But it's the presidents, the prime ministers, and it's the ministers. But, uh, you know, the action is in private sector. So yeah. I think uh, the idea is how do we promote private sector? Let's... Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, the question I want to ask you then, is you, you said that the SMEs are the really important things and the, and the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club is there to help them. Right now, those SMEs in South Africa or wherever else are suffering. So what, what are you actually doing right now uh, in order to help that? Well, you know, I've got I've got forty years experience, uh, and obviously, my father was a pioneer in industry. So, but my with my experience, I mean, I bought during my lifetime more than two thousand machinery from UK and exported. And I I am very passionate about MSME. I'm passionate about SMEs, and I've got several hundred chairmen, managing directors in different parts of the world, running industry. So I, this is what we have the last 40 years, you know, during my 72 countries visit, this is what I've always been talking about. To me, small is beautiful. To me, SME is beautiful. And each and every country has a different, uh, you know, SME status in their country. In, in Europe, SME means you need minimum to elevate poverty. You need to create jobs. To create jobs, the best thing you need is you need vocational training centers. Because without vocational training center, you can't produce entrepreneurs. So to produce entrepreneurs, you need the skill development, and that's where I'm talking. So luckily, in Africa, there is, especially South Africa, this is already done very well. Nigeria is looking into it. Ethiopia is looking into it. Kenya is looking into it. So I think it's a great opportunity for UK SMEs to uh, take an advantage because they want to go out. They want to, you know, I mean, they, they, so this is where I'm trying to, with help of Ian, to bring these uh, people close. And if we could finish the red tape and uh, the opportunity which we want to create is make the Commonwealth industrialists, the private sector sit in front of UK 
uh, uh, SMEs owners, that 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 will probably will uh, expedite things. Okay, we're going to develop some of that in, in the rest of the session. Let me turn to you then, Ian. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the in the minister's uh, session, where. I said to you, hang on a minute, people are going to be a little bit sceptical about Britain suddenly being interested in Africa because, let's face it, a lot of uh, British money and international money has gone into Southeast Asia, for example, in the past, and less so um, when it comes to, to Africa. You may uh, want to contradict me there, but but it, what it, this, just explain to me this new new interest, this new development of relations when it comes to, to Africa from the UK. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I think I can sum it up fairly simply in that myself and Mobin, um, we, we talked about this and it, it seemed the way forward is to set up an entrepreneur's club because in a way you are right. Because of the pull of Singapore, Hong Kong, as it was, um, obviously enormous interest throughout the, that part of the world. But also we, because of our relationship with Europe, which has got more complicated, um, we've really had to concentrate on probably the wrong things. We, we've now restarted and rebooted in a way. And, and listening to what we've been hearing from South Africa this morning, um, it shows that there is not only a market, but there is also an absolute need because a, a weak Africa is a problem for all of us. And, and it doesn't matter which part of Africa it is. It, it, it can be South Africa, it, we've heard from Nigeria, but it can be North Africa, West and East. Every part we need to look at. And I think this is where, as an entrepreneurs club, we're bringing together people, and Mobin has done a phenomenal job, it's a very quick, short time, in saying to people, well, we can change it. The other thing is that, you know, the city of London is led, by, is a market-driven um, organisation, and it is a massive resource. And one of the things we want to do is to, is to say to them that we've got all these SMEs right, Africa. They are by and large very well run they have accountancy legal everything else that we basically recognize at every level um you're not within the auspices of governments most of the time which is where people get a little bit nervous especially with certain governments and therefore we can invest and i think what we've got to look at and um dr Sien has actually sort of brought the point up about about the, the money following and i think where we are with market forces at the moment, this pandemic is going to take us some time to come out of this. There's no shadow of a doubt. Uh, the, the, the problems we've got with vaccines, the problems we have with just, um, dare I say, it, that people are nervous. Mm. So as I think, Roger, what we've got to say to people is, look, there's an opportunity. We need to build up our resources to say you, you don't just have to look at the Americas or South America. There is this entire continent which is open for business, always has been. And I think... Um, for whatever our history may be, Britain is very well placed to try and help in that. And I think we can help in that. So if we can, in, in, in Britain, in any small way, influence the city of London, and by doing that, you tend to influence the Americans as well, who can be very jaundiced about South Africa. They, they don't quite understand it. They, they, they remember it from the days of sort of, um, you know, problems in, in Namibia and problems in Rhodesia, as it was now Zimbabwe, obviously. And, th and they tend to look at it through a prism. And if we can break that prism down so that they say, oh, yes, actually, yes, this is a good place to do business. We can do it via London or New York. Then I think we can do that. But SME is the lifeblood of any economy, Raj, as you know, Raj, as you know. No, no more so than Africa, where SMEs start from literally nothing. And, and they suddenly build up into these incredible conglomerates. And if we can help in that, then we should. So... You know, it, it is a partnership. This is all partnership working. And, 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 and I think what holds us together is this funny old history that we have where there is a sort of family feeling that, oh, yeah, why shouldn't we help? We can help. And that, but that doesn't preclude parts of Africa that, we, that, that don't speak English, Chad, Niger, um, that, that what I call that sort of Western part. Um, and, and we can do that. I mean, our history with Morocco, which has never been part of any else with us, is 800 years old, trading. And we are very close. And again, that's just one example of what we're yeah. doing. So what you're saying is you're not precluding uh, dealing <clears throat> with non-Anglophone, for example, non-Commonwealth countries in the future. I mean, because all the talk that I've heard as well has been all about a much more of an African Union. You know, th th there's all sorts of economic initiatives going on, the continental yep. free trade area. All that stuff is very much about Africa and looking self, being more self-sufficient, being more together and coordinated. Does a Commonwealth body get in the way of that anyway? Is it, how, does, how does that coordinate? 
Well, th that's a very good point, actually. The answer is no, I don't think it does. What we try and do is we complement, because we've got, the thing about the Commonwealth, we, we've, we've always had the political side. That's always been there. And that's heads of government, speakers, uh, parliamentarians from across the Commonwealth. What we want to do is to bring in the other still, which is basically the business side. And that's where Mobin comes in. And it's not part of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, nothing to do with it. But I personally think it's an important part of what we're trying to do. You now, we have a very close affinity with the Francophonie countries, which is obviously the French old countries from, uh, from uh, within Paris. And we, we do work very well together, Roger. But I think this, this has got to be much bigger than just isolated ideas. But if you've got one thing that you can carry forward using that, we will do that. And I, I, and I really think we can do something very, very special. And South Africa is such a sort of orbit that um, utilising the, you know, the experiences of, of Cape Town and right across that, that region is incredibly important. And we have got an ongoing situation in Mozambique that has got to be resolved because it, if you don't, you just know what's going to happen. We've seen it in our lifetime, all of us, before in, in Africa. Um, and we don't want that happening again because you, everybody wants to have, see prosperity, successful, vibrant countries which are being properly backed and properly funded. I mean, just to concord with what you're saying, I mean, it's, you know, there is the old adage that, um, you know, that Africa is, is, is got a young demography. It's amazingly labour rich, if you like, but capital poor. We talk about the Western world, which is uh, ageing, uh, capital rich and in a sense, labour poor or in the future. And we, we need much more collaboration. So that's obviously going to be important. But in terms of how you see things at the moment, Right now, we have a kind of stasis where nothing is really going on. What, what can the Commonwealth do right now to, to encourage and, and boost investment? Well, I, I'm going to sort of come back to where Mobin's involved, if I may, is that the, one of the things that we set out to do is to bring people, not just from Commonwealth countries, a lot of Middle East um, people who we worked in partnership for generations, but we're trying to bring them together so that we can say, right, we've got this broad spectrum of people. So if there's an opportunity, so um, we'll take Nigeria just for instance, then we can say, look, there is this opportunity. This can be done. The City of London, New York Stock Exchange, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, let's see if we can get the funding together to do it. The other point that may be made was, is learning and skills, because that is actually absolutely crucial. It, 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 it can be any uh, tourism, anything. It, it's, people have got to be trained. And to do that, we have to be able to get training that is right for that country. And one of the things that the Commonwealth are trying to do is set up an academy that we will then bring young people, get that opportunity to do it. But you can only do so much. What we've got to try and do is also get that skill set within country. Now, that can be done through, uh, in the United Kingdom, it would be universities or what we call tertiary colleges, further education colleges, which are world renowned. And therefore we try and get them to take that on. So if we can do both sides using the Entrepreneurs Club, using government, using the country's resources, and all countries have good resources, to bring that together, then I think, Roger, we do have the basis of um, a very interesting future. And remember, we're coming out of the worst pandemic that we have in, in our lifetime, but since 1922, when we had the flu pandemic. Um, which didn't affect a lot of countries. This has affected every single country in the world. Uh, and therefore, everybody's got to come out as close as we can together um, with, a, with what I would call, you know, a hope for the future. Thank you. We'll come back to you. Um, let's just go back to, to South Africa um, and, and to you, Ilse. I, I was interested in, in what Mobin was saying about the private sector being really the way forward and not through government. How do you feel about that? With regards to what um, public funds is not, uh, we've seen definitely a shrink in terms of our fiscal purse. Um, and the, it's definitely has to be public led, uh, excuse me, private sector led with regards to raising capital. Um, I think that there's been a definitely being a big call. One of our funds that uh, is currently being rolled out in South Africa is called the Tourism Equity Fund, which is a, it's more of a, let's say, a public private partnership. Um, in relation to companies that are uh, for previously disadvantaged individuals to apply the majority um, to buy either shares in a company or in its, in its geared towards tourism businesses. So it's to enable and kickstart that funding process with regards to 
either people that want to buy a share in a business or invest into a sustainable, profitable business idea. So I think there's a there's, there's room where government needs to enter the fray. But if we don't have more of these public-private partnerships with a private sector, um, we're not going to do the need that this, get the necessary impact that we need to just bring a bit of stability with regards to in, in specifically with regards to tourism. And um, Ian also mentioned something which is quite imperative: is if we look at Africa as a whole and the the role of of um, travel and trade. Uh, whether it's through the Continental Free Trade Agreement, whether it's through air connectivity. Mm. Um, if we don't, because that's one of the big focus we've got from South Africa side is to increase the, the trading activities, which also has an impact on travel um, industries into Africa and into the regions. So there's definitely a symbiotic relationship that, that we have to pursue with regards to mm. travel and trade and um, investing into the right sort of catalysts like air connectivity, which we've seen in the past, we've done so heavily over the last four years, just to get more international flights into Cape Town um, and the Western Cape. And that's had a huge impact on our tourism industry. And of course, then your business um, travel and your, your other industries. And now it's spinning off into cargo opportunities. So the, the tourism, and that's the one thing with regards to the tourism industry, it plays such a critical connect yeah. like a connected economy role um mm. and i think the world is seeing that and the lack of that um travel that's happening yeah. if i can go to you uh, uh, dr Vivian, in terms of the, the vocational training and skills that Mobin and, and uh, Ian were both talking about there um how much is, is that needed right now in in cape town or do you have do you surely not have the facilities there the, the, the education and the colleges there that can do that uh, we do have a very good network of uh, universities and colleges in Cape Town. Um, we pride ourselves on being a close proximity to four major universities in the city of Cape Town. Um, and training is, is high on our agenda. But a word of caution, I see in many economies, the first um, reaction is to train more tourist guides. And there's an abundance of tourist guides that sit without work in many places all over the world due to the pandemic. So we need to be selective in what kind of training we want to do and for what are the future jobs that we, we foresee. But there's another aspect which I think uh, we, we need to touch on and that is the international law and legislation in and around risk mitigation. Um, we came unstuck in, in South Africa and in Cape Town with the interpretation of uh, force majeure which was not acknowledged by insurance companies in the same manner as the, um, the shareholders of the companies. So uh, I think in many cases, we, we saw uh, hopeful uh, SMMEs who said, I have a policy, I've paid for many years, this is force majeure, I need to be paid out, and insurance companies had a different opinion. I think we need to address that throughout Africa, uh, risk sharing, risk mitigation with tour operators, big tour operators, Operators, they all say, if I if I back the small guy, uh, my risk goes through the roof. So I stick to the the companies I know, and those are the old and the bigger companies. So we're trying to to break that down. We've had uh, many webinars in providing that information uh, to the industry, and then I also think we need to to be cognizant of the the need for resilient cities. Investors make decisions based on stability and security. And if we as local government, regional, national governments, all work together to provide stability in terms of infrastructure, in terms of policies, sound policies, clean government, which Cape Town prides itself on, uh, then we've got a great future together. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a question for the audience, which I think, which I think I want to direct to you, Mobin, as an in, as an, uh, an investor, if you like. Which is uh, the question is, what do you think about investment uh, for the West African coast, especially Sierra Leone, which holds 460 kilometres of coastline? Have all the of all this has all this potential um, been fully developed yet? What do you, what do you think? To that? Have you thought about that area? I think uh, you know uh, before I. Uh, uh, give him a reply. There are two things I want to discuss. One is, and that is again going back to the investment. So uh, I think a couple of years ago, I attended a very uh, 
expensive and a very decent public private partnership uh, conference in london and uh, so i was able to meet probably 150 uh, public private partners experts so this was probably one of the best conference i i've ever attended and you won't believe it it was a it was a three days conference and uh, my question my confusion was that what is the minimum cost what is the minimum cost of a public private partnership now this was a confusion i had asked this question from so many experts in uk so in this conference when it started in the first question answer session instead of asking a question with the panel i asked this question with the whole audience and i said guys i hope you don't mind just let me know what is the minimum cost of a ppp and you won't believe it for for 30 40 second it was quiet and then all of a sudden i heard somebody said 100 million dollar then somebody said 70 30 40 50 and during the three days i became a celebrity everybody approached me they said don't worry we can even do it 20 million dollars so this is a confusion i'm showing when you talk about i just wanted to <laughs> explain this when talk about public private partnership people just think oh you talk but in smes we don't need hundreds of millions of dollars we need 10 million dollars 20 million dollars or you can have three separate project and we can you know so so in a sense there's a great opportunity that it is misconstrued for people to understand what is ppp because the moment you talk about ppp they just say you talk about 500 million dollars 300 million dollars so so this is what now going back to that that look second thing is that in our with a and what we have done we discussed this topic in commonwealth entrepreneur club biggest difference is that this time we are inviting the other countries outside commonwealth that please do business with us now as an entrepreneur as an industrialist as in the, you know technocrat and social entrepreneur i read people's mind i talk to them in the last my 40 years i I've, i've seen one thing that uh, people wants to move forward but the biggest problem is finding a good partner now what we are doing in commonwealth entrepreneur club is that we are trying to find good partners for example in india pakistan sri lanka people are desperately looking for african market but the biggest problem is that when they go to africa they have a shock of their life because end of the day they end up with the wrong partners so they have not done their homework properly you see so finding so this is where we are coming into the picture where we are trying to create an awareness that okay i can get you a good partner so i think this is a win win situation that in a sense from london we are helping people to find good partners and maybe we also can collaborate with them so i think this is probably going to uh uh give an answer to the gentlemen that we are there we are there to help everyone it's not that you know we are we are we, we we want to help the whole 54 countries but on top of that we want to help the global countries as well to come and work with us and we'll find you good partners to collaborate with okay so in answer to that question yes you would be looking at sierra leone for example you would be encouraging members of yes. the club to look yes. to there as well absolutely absolutely okay. Okay there's so much we more more we could talk about I want to talk about female entrepreneurship I want to talk about technology fintech there's so much more in this category again I go back to this point when we all meet in person which could even be in September uh in Cape Town I hope that we can all sit around a table and discuss these things in so much more detail but gentlemen and and, and Ilsa thank you very much indeed for joining us for this session um please hang around Now coming up we have uh, a panel on resilience with uh, a big friend of the ITIC uh um, Edmund Bartlett uh hosting so um stick around for that see you soon
of your life. Hello, hi. Um, let me welcome you to the next session today. And this session is talking about the theme of rebuilding Africa's travel and tourism sector while enhancing its resilience. So really dealing with the challenges of how we balance the rebuilding and recovery of the travel and tourism sector with the need to enhance resilience. My name is Professor Lee Miles. I'm the Professor of Crisis and Disaster Management at Bournemouth University Disaster Management Centre. I'm not Edmund Bartlett, although Edmund Bartlett will be featured on the panel today. And I'm delighted to be joined by an all-star all -star stellar cast. And we'll be talking about this from a number of ways. So I'll just introduce them individually as to who they are. Uh, I'd first I'd like to welcome Gloria Guevara, who's President and CNO of the World Travel and Tourism Council. I'd also like to welcome Honourable Francisco de la Torre, the Mayor of the City, city of Malaga in, in Spain. I'd also welcome uh, uh, the Honourable Edmund Bartlett, Minister for Tourism from Jamaica. Uh, I'd also like to welcome uh, the Right Honourable Minister uh, David Marnier, from, uh, the Minister for Economic Development of the Western Cape. And I'd also, of course, not but not least, uh, would like to welcome Henry Katonga uh, from, uh, from Zambia. And finally, uh, probably a name that everybody knows, Dr. Uh, 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 Tali Rafai, uh, ITCC chairman and, of course, um, uh, former uh, Secretary General of the UNWTO. So without further ado, because we've got a large number of people uh, to cover, uh, and I'm going to ask each of them to provide some very short opening rights. I'm going to introduce uh, Gloria Guevara who, from the President and CEO of the W. Uh, of the world WTTC, who will give us a short presentation really looking at the importance of the current issues related to travel and tourism. Over to you, Gloria. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Greetings from London. Thank you for this invitation. On behalf of the global private sector, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. As you know, WTTC represents a little bit over 200 CEOs from around the world, all geographies, all industries. And of course, we also represent, as we have SMEs as part of our members. These are some of the faces that hopefully are familiar with you. Chris Nasset is our current chair, and we all speak one voice. For 30 years, we have been doing economic impact report. And let me just share with you briefly the data that we just released um, recently in terms of how big was the impact of the pandemic last year. If you recall in, in our previous uh, report in 2019, travel and tourism contributed to 10%, 10.4% of the global GDP. That's equivalent to $9.1 trillion or 9,100 billion, uh, depends on how do you measure. Unfortunately, last year we saw a very uh, impressive decline, 49%. We lost around $4.5 trillion. And the contribution from our sector was um, down to 5.5. So that, that was a huge decline compared to the global economy, which went down 3.7%. Travel and tourism globally went down 49%. 62 million jobs almost globally are lost, are gone. From 334 million jobs globally that we had in 2019, last year we ended the year with 272. Very important to highlight that here we still have many jobs at risk, like 100 million jobs are still at risk because in many countries around the world, we still have schemes like the furlough schemes or protections from governments. We have reduced also the number of hours. So in addition to this, these 62 million jobs, this number can increase 100 more if we don't implement the right public policies. For the last five years before the pandemic, very important also to highlight of all the new jobs created around the world, one in four were from our sector. So this still is the best sector to create jobs and provide opportunities to many nations around the world. Now, very brief, let me share with you the regions. How is the decline in the different regions? At WTTC, we have data for 185 countries around the world and all these regions. And here you can compare the different regions of the world, the decline of uh, GDP, because we not only look at the number of travelers, international and domestic, we look at the spend and the impact on the economy. And also, of course, the jobs. In the case of Africa, as you can see here, the region had a very similar impact. That globally, it was 49% the decline in the GDP. And the impact on jobs, it was uh, almost 30% with 7 million jobs impacted, which has been, as we know, devastating. Here, of course, you have some other regions and you can see the comparisons, but 
this COVID uh, pandemic has been devastating for everyone. Now, moving forward, what do we see and, and what has been the struggle? And here the question is, how do we achieve a fair balance where public health is a priority for all of us, for everyone, but at the same time, we're suffering from mental health, domestic abuse has been increased in many countries around the world. The social impact is devastating. We have seen an increase in poverty, increase in poaching, for instance, in illegal wildlife trade, a, a lot of job losses, as I say before, increase in exploitation. And the question is, how do we balance this out? And in the next slide, which is the last one, I just wanted to highlight the importance for Africa and the rest of the world to come together and to define an international mobility protocol. We need to have clear rules. The word here is certainty. In one end, if someone is tested positive, that individual has to be put in quarantine. But entire countries should not be considered as infected and considered entire countries put in quarantine. We need to move from country assessment to individual assessment and use the solutions and the technologies available. So, the quarantine should be for individuals. And at the same time, what we see more and more around the world, where we're moving in Europe, the US, and, and many regions, is that in a protocol that if someone has been vaccinated, the country will issue, as you see here in the top right of this chart, certificate. That or a rapid COVID uh, test um, negative that will be included in a digital lab. So if you were not fortunate to be vaccinated because the vaccines are limited, you should be able to present a negative test, but a rapid negative test, test that would allow you to have this mobility in conjunction with the safe travel protocols that we have been working in the private sector, just, such as wearing the mask, hygiene and distancing, this would allow us to resume international travel. In the case of Europe, besides the vaccine and the test, they are also considering having the antibodies for COVID, someone that had been infected in the last six months. Similar is gonna be in the US and other regions, but if we can have agreement among the countries of Africa, that would allow us to resume international travel and bring back the millions of jobs impacted. So here, as I said before, to have clear rules and requirements are the foundation to resume international travel and, and move forward. Thank you for the opportunity. And now back to the professor. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Short, sweet, and to the point. That's how we like those kind of presentations. So thank you very much for that. I'd just like to ask one question, really, before we move on to, to the next speaker, and that's just to, to highlight uh, some of the challenges. I think one of the things that comes out really strong from your presentation is that in many ways, when we talk about helping Africa or in many ways providing a kind of balanced approach, we're often talking about providing sort of movement of resources. But what your presentation shows is that for the travel and tourism sector, the impact was a global one, that the global travel and tourism sector is not really in a fit for purpose position to be often to be able to provide that kind of uh, partnership arrangement in the way that it would hope. But from your point, you mentioned a lot about the mobility protocol. And I wondered whether from your perspective, if you were to say what would be the next immediate action to achieve that? What would you propose or would you recommend? Is it something that has to happen in Africa or is it something that has to happen at, uh, more at the global stage? I think the challenge last year, and it's still the challenge uh, to tell the truth, is the, the, the lack of international collaboration because of we were not prepared for this pandemic and countries were looking to their own, of course, to protect their citizens, but we need to have this balance. So my recommendation for Africa, yeah, similar yeah, to the recommendation for Europe out. and other countries, mm -hmm. which is basically, how do we define these rules? How do we work together, right? And this has to do with this mobility protocol. If Africa can create a coalition and learn from what's going on in Europe and other parts of the world and have these rules very clear and implement testing before departure mm -hmm. or accept the vaccine as valid and have the rules clear so that we can resume international travel to uh, Africa, uh, we should be able to have the, the income from uh, international travel uh, and the positive impact. Uh, I'm sorry, I think you're muted. Thank you, Gloria. 
Thank you um, for that comment. And that was quite pertinent to be said. And in the first part of this uh, discussion, really, I want to bring together some of the global uh, perspectives in this sense. So uh, our next speaker, I'm delighted to uh, welcome the Honourable uh, Francisco de la Torre, who's the mayor of the city of Malaga in Spain. And in practice, we, we've heard quite uh, uh, on the grapevine and in many instances about the successful work that, that Malaga has done in relation to dealing with both the uh, COVID-19 challenges. Yeah. So in a sense, I'd like to invite the mayor to pr provide some brief comments, basically, as to uh, what his position is and how his things have worked out in Malaga and past experiences, and more importantly, any reflections he may have. Over to you, sir, and welcome to the panel. Thank you very much, dear uh, Professor, the mice. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, uh, I have problem in the time, my time, it's a pity, uh, because at the end of my work, uh, I must go with other uh, connection in other time, in other question, but uh, Julian Dradek uh, remains here for to continue in the domain with the intersigns of idea. No? Their friend Talev, uh, their Gloria Guevara, uh, President of the World Travel and Tourist Council, Excellence and colleagues, thank you for giving me this, this opportunity to participate in this panel discussion and share with the audience why Malaga became one of the most important European tourist destinations, our residents during COVID-19 and the new challenge on sustainable tourism. During more than a decade ago, we have been working on positioning our city as one of the leading cities in urban and cultural tourism in Europe. Uh, the figures about the tourist result confident this achievement increase in number without decreasing the sustainability of our destination. Before COVID-19, Malaga took his leading position for different reasons. With more than 3,000 years of history, Phoenicia, Roman, and Nazareth monument, and excellent weather, and a cultural offer of 36 museums, Picasso, Pompidou, Russian collection of modern art, this great legacy, and our location in the south of Spain by the Mediterranean Sea, made that the heritage and the tourist offer of Malaga became unrivaled uh, in Europe. Also, our pedestrian areas in the historical center, surrounded by buildings with centuries of history behind with modern leisure and gastronomical spot. Just to give you an idea, Malaga has direct flight connection with more than 100 cities all over the world, and we are considered as one of the top 10 cities in the world for living regarding the Forbes magazine. It is obvious that the COVID-19 also affected the tourism of our city, but from the very first moment, we worked hard to preserve our industry and to maintain the brand awareness in the mindset of the international travelers. Some of the different experiences we put in practice to support the tourists during the lockdown in the past year were focused to provide and to warranty safety and security, since it was the first thing to control. We create the Malaga reactivation plan, including different strategies and actions to take as a priority. One of the most important actions was the creation of the campaign We Care to Care of You, which consists in a total of 30,000 antigen tests related to the travel and tourist professional within our city on a weekly basis. This action allows us to control the spread of the COVID-19 of the professional of the tourist industry, avoiding and stopping any kind of potential spread of the infection, increasing the confidence of both professional and national travel. This action creates to guarantee the safety of the city with a company with the communication campaign to inspire and motivate the local citizens and professional to do this free test weekly. This campaign has been a success and uh, it is still working, providing a clear image of safety in the city for any visitor willing to come for business or leisure. While we wanted the seamless control of the infection, we took care of the tourism strategy. In June 2020, we created six different local restoration forums with the proposal of research, uh, the different tourist segments of the city being prepared for the post-COVID time. This forum were made by local companies, tourist professionals, city authorities, and city institutions. And we all together decide to ensure a strategy to tackle uh, issues and challenges 
as for example, how to guarantee, guarantee the already mentioned safety, uh, what to incorporate in addition to the already mentioned antigen test. Some of the challenges relate to the tourism strategy were discussed in this forum, and they brought some ideas in communication and promotional campaign, both national and international, on how to recover the air connectivity, among others. Uh, this forum also allowed us to discuss about how to handle the new limitation on carrying capacity and our tourist resource and company in Malaga. One of the conclusions we decided to put into practice is to not to leave the promotional campaign, not to that tourist professional campaigns. Therefore, we continue spreading the brand awareness of the city of Malaga, but focusing uh, focusing on digital campaigns, both uh, in social media and through digital sale calls. We want to also mention uh, to you that during this sad period, we learned that collaboration is a must to build resilience, and we have created different joint campaigns with some national cities here in Spain to keep motivating the national market. They're getting those which became representative in the past. The tourists need to receive the message that their city being prepared for them and willing to welcome them as soon as the new normality comes. Hence, in Malaga, we took advantage of this time using them uh, to boost our core values based on quality of life and welcoming soul. And we use this month to design the new tourist strategy plan valid until 2024. Okay. We want to continue working on concrete pilots where uh, our tourist strategy must be based as far as sample, the accessibility of the city, the sustainability of the destination, the innovation of our tourist experience and the digitalization of our offer. We had the chance to even incorporate new strategy to overcome new potential pandemic situation we could uh, suffer uh, in the future, preparing quick protocol to provide safety from the very first moment it could occur. And the most important point is to mention that this strategic plan was designed with the collaboration of, the, of all the public and private uh, stakeholders of our city, all together giving insight and objective to reach from this time until the year 2024. This is really a milestone. This is a good example of how Malaga took this moment as an opportunity to improve everything related with our travel and tourist industry. Once we took care of the qualities of the local safety and health security, we continued working on promotion and communication of Malaga as a tourist destination. We decided to create an international campaign to spread the voice on how safe and how open our destination is called Malaga better than ever, including all the measures taken and mentioned previously. But we will, uh, we talk about concrete experience to support the tourists, the local tourists. I must say, for example, that we maintain the museums open and we even incentivize our citizens to come and visit them, adding a special benefit at free parking in the city center of free family ticket, for example, among other measures. We also digitalize all the, our tourist route of the city allowing anyone to visit the city with social distance and security no matter the time of the day. Okay. It's what our responsibility to maintain the sense of belonging with our city, to protect the intangible values of our destination as they are welcoming mood and the friendship soul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and I uh, we really, are, really would love to help you all with this uh, speech uh, with the uh, continue with uh, Mr. Andrade in the moment of the interchange idea. Thank you. I Thank must... you very much. Have you got time for a question or must you leave now, Mayor? Okay. Hello. Yeah, just, just one question. You talked about communication plans. You talked about working together with stakeholders. And you actually talked a little bit about some of the things that Gloria was alluding to, which was actually the importance of international mobility protocols about um, people about testing. Which one issue would you advise would be best practice for African cities, for example, to take up from your experience in Malaga? Which would be the one issue that you would say would be, has been the most successful thing that Malaga has done, briefly? I think uh, 
is necessary in the protocol for mobility, international mobility, uh, to work uh, all together. No? Uh, in Europe, I think it's necessary add the addition of OCD, the National Organization of Cooperation and Development Economy, a, a United Nation also, no? on MET, uh, Tourism World Organization, no? uh, because it's necessary to, to arrive, have the uh, card, uh, the card, free card, no? uh, the passport green, card. but also uh, the possibility of the antigen test. I think the possibility of antigen test is not being well provided, being approached. Mm -hmm. right. It's necessary to, to study, uh, to take all the possibility in this way, because uh, while arrive the vaccination, general vaccination, it's necessary to work in this way, I think it's necessary. Uh, not, not only uh, to wait vaccination for all people. Okay? Uh, I, I think the, the city of Africa to think, uh, create also a space for safety in your city and to work in the tourist in nature. I think the tourist in nature now is perhaps one possibility very strong, con one possibility because the people, the tourists, uh, prefer look in the Europe. space uh, with nature is more secure than a space in the city. Thank you very much, Mayor, for your Thank time. You. Thank you for joining Bye -bye. us. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I just Sorry. want to name. Thank you very much, sir. I leave uh, Mr. Andrade. Thank you. Uh, I can I now move on uh, to the last of the global speakers, if you like, and we have a short presentation uh, filmed from Minister Bartlett, uh, uh, Edmund Bartlett, Minister of Tourism from Jamaica, and he'll be talking about the issues in relation to Dispera in, in particular. So I'll hand over now for to the organisers to for the production of the the talk. Thank you. Excellencies, ministers of uh, tourism, and other distinguished colleagues and partners in this very important uh, international tourism investment conference. Uh, on behalf of all of us in the Caribbean and the Global Resilience and Crisis Management Center, I want to say how privileged we feel to participate in this very august body and more so to share ideas on a matter that is of such great importance to the future development of tourism and the global economy. As is the case for most other developing nations across the world, travel and tourism has become one of the key drivers of growth across the African continent, especially within the last 10 years. In 2018, tourist arrivals among African destinations grew by 5.6%, which was the second fastest growth rate among all regions and stronger than global average growth of 3.9%. 10 year receipts for the continent shows that tourist arrivals in fact increased from 26 million in 2000 to an estimated 70 million in 2019. The contribution of tourism to African GDP was measured at US 168 billion in 2019, the equivalent to 7.1% of the total GDP. Tourism also generated close to 25 million jobs, while visitor expenditures generated US $61.3 billion or 10.4% of total exports. Unfortunately, even against the backdrop of this strong performance among African destinations in recent years, the tourism industry in Africa remains very fragile, simultaneously exemplifying resilience and vulnerability, with both manifesting at regular intervals and with equal intensity. Despite being the second most populous continent, Africa received only 5% of the 1.1 billion people who traveled to global destinations in 2019. To put this into perspective, the Caribbean, which is a sub-region of 43 million people, received 2.8% of the international tourists in 2019, almost equal to Africa's share. Africa's relatively small share of the global tourism market then 
is even more disappointing against the backdrop that the continent is endowed with many natural assets that can enhance its tourism competitiveness, including abundant natural resources, wildlife, marine life, cultural diversity, and extensive natural attractions. Therefore, the continent has great potential to develop segments that are currently in greater demand, such as natural adventure tourism, cultural heritage tourism, and travel for wellness, health, and retirement purposes. We can, however, conclude from the available evidence that the African continent has significant untapped tourism potential. Before African destinations are, however, able to maximize their full growth potential, they will first have to confront some of the major constraints. Many African destinations have traditionally and more intensely since the emergence of the climate change phenomenon experienced exaggerated risks associated with droughts, earthquakes, floods, cyclones, food insecurity, biodiversity loss, population displacement, and disease outbreaks. Even as countries across the continent are currently battling the COVID-19 pandemic. Many are simultaneously managing other outbreaks linked to cholera, Ebola, Lassa fever, malaria, measles, polio, and yellow fever. The current pandemic has had a devastating impact on African destinations. While case fatality ratio, that is a CFR for COVID-19 in Africa remains low, than the global CFR, the continent has traditionally had an underdeveloped and small intercontinental tourism sector, with most of its annual visitors arriving from hard-hit regions and countries such as China, the US, Great Britain, and Germany. Ultimately, the combination of national lockdowns, a tiny local tourism customer base, and an industry aimed at big spending foreign visitors means that the African tourism industry has limited capacity to adapt to the prolonged downturn in international travel. Africa recorded a 75% decline in tourist arrivals in 2020 and an estimated US dollar 120 billion in GDP contributions from tourism in 2020. This translates to over five times the loss in receipts recorded in 2009 during the global economic and financial crisis. This also translates into a loss of 12.4 million jobs, or 51% less jobs in the tourism sector based on the 2019 and 2020 figures. Expectedly, Many local communities, especially those in the vicinity of wildlife conservation areas, and which depend on tourism for their economic livelihoods, are now facing risk of starvation and lack of basic humanitarian services due to the steep tourism decline experienced over the past several months. The current pandemic has only magnified some of the more traditional structural challenges facing many African destinations. These challenges have weakened their resistance and resilience threshold. They include underdeveloped infrastructure, political instability, lack of security, safety and high crime, difficulty faced by investors in accessing finance, high taxes on tourism investment, low levels of tourism skill, red tape and bureaucracy, and low levels of budgetary support from governments, even in destinations where tourism is a major economic contributor. It is clear that the task of tourism recovery among African destinations requires a strong tourism resilience framework based on elements such as cross-sectoral collaborations, international funding and technical assistance, the development 
of comprehensive warning systems, the development of resilience barometers, research and development, human resource development and training, improved marketing tools, greater involvement of African diaspora, and this is a very important point globally, building destination attractiveness and security, uh, while also enabling efforts to build resilience and product development among local communities, and also to support the growth of niche markets. As a focal institution for coordinating strategies and interventions to enhance tourism resilience globally, the Global Tourism Resilience and Crisis Management Center, the GTRCMC, which I co-chair with Professor Talib Rafai, stands ready to help put together a recovery coalition for African destination and to enhance the overall resilience of these countries. This coalition may include the African tourism ministers, hoteliers, and other industry leaders, representatives of the private sector, members of the academic community, members of the African diaspora, community groups, native tribes and representatives of local, regional, and international tourism organizations, including the African Tourism Board. This will build on the work that we have already started through the establishment of one of our satellite centers at Kenyatta University in Kenya in 2019, and another that we have earmarked for the Seychelles. Finally, I also believe that there will be a growing demand for tourism products in the post-COVID era that will offer Africa a source of competitive advantage. The demand, I think, for tourism products, including cultural heritage, as well as health and wellness, is likely to grow as the habits of visitors increasingly shift from laser fair tourism to sustainable tourism. To this end, African destinations in partnership with cruise lines, as well as other international tourism authorities, especially in North America and Europe, can explore the possibility of a multi-destination arrangement that will allow tourists to, for example, immerse themselves in the experiences or route of the Middle Passage. African tourism industry leaders should also aggressively target the African diasporas, especially those in North America where I am located, to encourage them to consider Africa as a viable, attractive tourism market, with the goal being to develop attractive products and packages to incentivize diasporic communities in the Americas to visit African destinations. In fact, the African diaspora in the Americas has the financial capability and the investment capacity to offer great support to the building and rebuilding of African tourism. We have developed the expertise in marketing and product development and in infrastructure. And we have also have the capital market with the capacity to come in and to invest. So this conference should make the PLE and make a big statement of the need for African to package the destination for investment in the Americas. I thank you. Thank you very much. You've heard from uh, Minister Bartlett there and the interesting, insightful comments he has about the role of stakeholders and dis disparate there. I'd like to move on now to a more African perspective. And we've taken a lot of global views there as to what, what are some of the could the best practice issues that might be considered. So I'm delighted to, uh, to now introduce uh, the Honourable Minister David Manier, who is the Minister for Economic Development at the, in the Western Cape government in South Africa. And really, uh, over to you, David, I'd like you just to really just briefly outline what you perceive in your own reflection of being the critical challenges in supporting local uh, tourism industry in the Western Cape. Can you unmute, David? Uh, thank you, Lee. I know that you're very constrained by time, and so I'll try and keep my uh, opening remarks as, 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 as short as possible. 
I mean, I think uh, very much building on the presentation, the, the tourism industry, of course, in our province is a, a real backbone of our economy. Uh, and it was very hard hit uh, and many, many uh, jobs, to use the glorious term, were uh, erased in, in the Western Cape. Of course, we'd also hoped that this year would be a year of actually recovery in our economy uh, after what many participants will remember was a very devastating drought uh, in uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, which I'm delighted to say that we are over. But we look back and say, well, what are the lessons that we learned in dealing with the drought uh, in dealing uh, with the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? And key to our success in uh, achieving behavior change and overcoming the drought was a campaign called the Day Zero Campaign. And so if we look back, what we learned uh, dealing with that crisis, which was not dissimilar to the COVID-19 crisis, is that really effective communication was central to that campaign with exhaustive, sustained communication uh, through absolutely every channel. Uh, radio, billboards, prints, social media, uh, and in shopping malls. Direct engagements with business was absolutely uh, vital. So what we did was we uh, uh, adapted our uh, Day Zero campaign to deal with COVID-19. We set up, for example, a COVID-19 content center to deal with health and safety protocols and communicate directly uh, with business and also provide helplines for businesses to be in contact with government uh, to, uh, to uh, learn to adapt to the environment. We held continuous engagements uh, with uh, the sector. We uh, ensured that the sector was destination ready and uh, was uh, absolutely ready to implement our health uh, guidelines. We distributed a wide range of a collateral for the COVID-19 uh, awareness, and we held numerous webinars with with the uh, with the um, with the sector. And in the end, I think that the you know the big lessons would be ensure that your crisis com ca uh, communication plan with business and tourists is, is critical. You need an, a real authoritative platform where business can actually access the latest information and get uh, immediate uh, answers. We need to provide regular opportunities uh, for direct engagement with business and uh, at the end of the day also then uh, start to prepare for recovery which we've done by uh, starting to prepare international tourism campaigns to keep us uh, front of mind we've launched a remote working campaign and we obviously con uh, continue with direct uh, support to businesses in the tourism and hospitality sector Thank you, David. Can I just ask a very short question? All the, pre all the presentations so far have very much talked about the idea of communication and communication plans, about maintaining constant dialogue. And of course, the tourism sector is always very good at this in relation to it. But if we take Gloria's point about bringing in new protocols, what, it, what, what for you is the main challenges of trying to communicate protocols to tourism uh, uh, audiences who are often interested in well-being, not rules. So in a sense, is, is there a challenge there for you? And, and if, do you have an insight as to how that could be done in Africa? Well, look, we've, we've very uh, successfully, I think, in our province implemented uh, a range of health and safety protocols. We've been, I think, very effective in communicating directly with, uh, with tourists and with businesses in the tourism and hospitality sector to talk about those. Uh, safety protocols. We do have a, a slightly unique uh, communication uh, issue which we are dealing with, and that's of course uh, the uh, in the narrative. There is a narrative about the South African variant uh, of uh, the of the virus, and of course, <laughs> the truth is that that variant was uh, first discovered here, and is I think a testament to the excellent uh, science in our, our province. But also, of course, you know, this variant, uh, even although it was first sort of discovered in one of our provinces, we don't know really where it originated. Uh, and it's been found in more than about 30 countries. So, but the truth of the matter is that that narrative uh, does cause potential reputational damage to our destination. And we have uh, put in a, a dedicated communication campaign, uh, particularly in our key international source markets, to, to overcome uh, uh, that uh, potential risk and make sure 
that that risk uh, is mitigated. And again, Lee, it's not dissimilar to what we experienced in the drought. It took, there was a big lag time uh, between, in fact, uh, us overcoming the, the, the virus, uh, overcoming the, the drought uh, and the perception in our international uh, 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 markets about the drought. And so we had to invest a lot of time and effort uh, overcoming those potential, uh, as it were, risks. Uh, and I think that we've done it extremely successfully in the Western Cape. Fantastic. Thank you, David. I'd just like to bring in uh, Henry Katanga, Director of Human Resources from the Ministry of Tourism in, in Zambia. Uh, welcome, Henry. Can you hear me there? Henry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Henry, uh, I can. Uh, David, David was talking about actually the, the challenges of communicating protocols. So could you just very briefly outline for me uh, from the national level of an African state like Zambia, what would you perceive to be the, the main challenge? And if you take David's point about dealing with different types of hazards at the same time, droughts and also COVID-19, well, how you perceive that's, that you can manage these two issues and promote tourism recovery at the same time. Do you have anything from the Zambian experience that you'd like to mention there? Okay. Uh, the major challenges that we seem to have in dealing with these challenges uh, that can, uh, the, for example, like the way COVID has come, We've had issues, uh, funds for recovery in terms of uh, where we are, and then also data availability and also health facilities. For example, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, testing, uh, people like those that go to Livingstone will have to maybe get to a facility which is very far. So we've had challenges in ensuring that uh, we bring uh, services closer to the people as part of the recovery program. So in a sense, you're using kind of multiple instruments to be able to deal with these, 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 these constant challenges that you're facing. And do you see it as a short-term or long-term challenge in dealing with these multiple issues that you've got? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, short-term measures in dealing with these issues, um, what we've done is, uh, 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 in the short term, we, we have developed health and safety protocols and uh, ensured that certain facilities that uh, are upgraded so that we're able to take care of uh, the shortcomings that we've had so far. And um, part of it has been uh, uh, upgrading facilities, especially in the health sector. So mainly dealing with and also uh, the other way, yes, basically infrastructure. Then the other way has been to strengthen collaboration in the region uh, with our colleagues in terms of uh, health protocols. And uh, this way, I think it's we thought it would be able to uh, help mitigate the shortcoming that we've had. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm just going to, you mentioned straight away about the need for regional cooperation. And that was something that Gloria talked about right at the start. Uh, may I introduce Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Talib? Can I introduce you now? From your extensive experience, uh, uh, both as, as a former Secretary General of the UNWTO, uh, Talib, can I just ask you in particular, in what, you, what you perceive to be the challenges of cooperation between countries in providing these kind of regional cooperation? And what, what would be the number one advice that you would give in pushing this agenda forward from your perspective. Talib, you need to unmute yourself. It's an existence of political will. The political will is the most important thing. I think African countries must come together. There must be a big meeting for the, for the ministers, not just of tourism, tourism of health, of finance, for, for nature, natural... Uh, parks or anything like that. They must all come together. They must be told by a certain international body. You cannot leave this room for you agree on a unified protocol. Like Gloria said, you can't just play around with this. No matter how good any country is, no matter how good any city is, I heard the mayor of Malaga, for example, talking about a wonderful experience. But that's not good enough because people of Malaga are going to be receiving people from other places. And people of America will go to other places. So we have to bring everybody together. 
it has to be done. It's the only way. The multilateral system has to start operating again. This my is my main point. Thank you, Talib. I mean, uh, in terms of what, what you've talked about, and just to bring this to a close, because I'm very conscious of time, many people have stressed the idea of a particular solution in terms of an international mobility protocol, and they've talked in particular about the need for a regional solution um, and the need for active multilateralism. That seems important, but I, what David and, and Henry have shown is that the African voice has to be central to this, and fundamentally, it's not a global protocol of the first world de deciding the rules in the form of kind of vaccine nationalism, but fundamentally, the global solution has to have a strong African voice because what this panel has shown from David and from Henry is that there's real African experiences about making this a global solution and I think if there's of anything course. that needs to be brought to the table it's that. Of course, of course, of course. You have to start with your own neighbourhood, you have to start with your own region and then you go international. If Africa has a lot to gain, it comes together and it can come together. Africa is a continent that has proven it can work together very well and uh, difficult circumstance. And that's why Africa is very important, because people are going to come to Africa from all kinds of the world. And Africans will have to travel somewhere else. So everybody's a winner, everybody's a loser if we don't come together. So fundamentally, this 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 uh, this protocol fundamentally is not just about vaccines. It's also about an African voice, and more importantly, one of the previous speakers in the previous discussion talked about equal risk. That borders will only open up and protocols will only work if effectively there's reciprocity between those. And the challenge is with constant threats is you have constant different types. My information, my information is it will take five years for the whole world to have seventy percent of the population being vaccinated. Yeah. So we can't just depend, like Gloria said, can't just depend on vaccination. Vaccination passport alone is not enough. We have to combine that with also uh, testing and antibodies testing as well. Because otherwise, it will become a political game of those that have it and those that, that do not have it. For example, a country like Mozambique, what does it have to do to receive people? It cannot do it on its own. It cannot vaccinate 70% of its population tomorrow or the day after, or the year after. It would take five years, as yeah. I said, to Thank have 70% yeah. of the world. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is the nature, of the nature of travel, is bringing mm -hmm. people together. Okay, well, we've, we're short of time now, so effectively I'm going to wrap this panel up. Thank you very much to my uh, speakers and really just to hone a number of important points about the importance of key agendas like international protocols, the need for a key meeting with a political will which underpins it, and fundamentally that the African voice of experiences, like in the Western Cape and in Zambia, should be brought to the table seriously in shaping those wills forward. It's not simply driven by a global agenda, but in Africa it has to be driven with a strong African voice. Thank you very Spirit. much from everybody. And uh, I'll bring this session to a close. Thank you. Thank all. you, Miles. Thank you. You should take away the word disaster from your part. <laughs>
It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you on the Effective Branding and Marketing for Africa session in the panel. And uh, Africa has been, Mama Africa, I, I should say, uh, is welcoming us to explore the whole range of different uh, resources and the wonderful things and experience that it has got to give us. Africa um, brings, tourism is bringing to Africa about 8.5 of the GDP. It brings about 71 million arrivals and about $40 billion. This, of course, 2019 uh, numbers. And those of us who have been working with Africa for many years who know the, the range of uh, experiences that can offer and how uh, regenerative and, and transformative those experiences are. I don't, uh, we don't have a lot of time and we've got some uh, fantastic colleagues uh, in, in the panel and I would like to introduce them. Uh, the Honorable uh, Minister uh, Najim Balala from Kenya, uh, who needs no introductions, uh, is one of the most active uh, tourism ministers uh, in the world. And he is probably the only minister in the world that has got the title of Minister of Tourism and Wildlife. And uh, he is at the, at, the, at the essence of sustainability and how he is doing, uh, how Africa is actually uh, driving tourism. Wonderful to see you, Minister Balala. Uh, we've got Claire Akabanzi, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Rwanda Development Board. Claire is a very experienced executive. She has worked with um, uh, the office of the minister oh, of the of the president in the past, and uh, she had an international career uh, in seven countries in three continents, uh, doing a whole range of things uh, in international trade and and investment. Then we've got my good friend Kudbert uh, Nube, uh, he, who is the chairman of the African Tourist Board based in South Africa. He's a very uh, seasoned uh, tourism uh, professional uh, running his uh, different organizations, uh, including a hotel, and he is the chairman of the African Tourist Board. And we've got uh, all the way from Shanghai, China, we've got Marcus Lee, uh, who is the chairman of the Small and Medium Enterprises Business Owner Association in China. Uh, and Marcus is, is very much um, involved in China investment, and he has been driving a whole range of initiatives to, uh, uh, to, to, to bring investment in Africa and around the world uh, for tourism. So I, I, I can introduce you for a long time, but I think, I think uh, uh, people and audience can actually see your, your credentials. I'd like to open this conversation and say, look, um, obviously uh, we've been discussing about Africa for a long time, and I'd like to know some of the latest initiatives that you are taking in Kenya and then Pan-African and then in Rwanda um, about marketing and branding of, of of uh, Africa and how you bring Africa to the world uh, in a way that we communicate the beauty and the resources of Africa. Minister, would you like to start, please? Yes. Thank you very much, Professor. Nice to meet you again. And uh, I'm glad I'm meeting my good friend, uh, the chairman of uh, African Tourism Board. And uh, Marcus, uh, nice to see you again. Uh, Claire, you are my neighbor here. So it's very good uh, to, to see you. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm glad we are talking about branding Africa. Uh, the unfortunate part is that the continent of Africa is not homogeneous. Uh, it's not homogeneous in terms of language. It's not homogeneous in terms of political uh, regimes. Uh, and, and again, the only thing we can pride ourselves as Africa is that we have a diverse product across the continent in the neighborhood. That is the, 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 the positive angle about the continent of Africa. Uh, the only, and there are many challenges about it. The only thing that I can see the stigmatization by international media about the image of Africa. And we need, this is the time probably we in the continent of Africa need to change the narrative. The narrative is not about wars in Africa, it's not about diseases in Africa. Look at the pandemic itself. 
Yeah. Despite we have weak health, 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 health institutions, yeah, we have been spared from the rest of the, of, of the world. We don't celebrate for the rest of the world, but we have been spared. And we took measures in Africa, much more stringent measures than the rest of the world. And that's why we have been spared. But unfortunately, we are again being, being categorized as most of the countries in Africa as are in the red list of countries that have been sanctioned of no travel to the continent of Africa. And this is totally not acceptable. Uh, we, uh, this stigmatization, I, I, I'm sorry to say that, is still a hangover of colonialization. Yeah, we are not colonized anymore. We are a free nation and we need to come to, to, to say the truth. We have managed our pandemic in a better way than most parts of the, uh, of, of the world. Yeah, but again, we are, whenever we want to move forward in terms of branding uh, the continent, we are being pulled back by different stigmatized uh, institutions. For example, Africa is not the dark continent anymore. Africa has the largest, or the largest population of young people, below 30, uh, 30 years old. Yeah? Africa is the future. Africa is where the resources are. Africa is where it has everything in one continent. That is Africa. It has the weather, it has the people, and the, and the middle class population is double. Than it. And also a double digit increase of, of, of GDP is in the African continent. But, Minister, but, but I... see the challenge, Professor, is that there's still stigma against the continent of Africa. And that is what we should work together to remove it. Yeah, it's easy to, to say that we, are, we, we, we can rebrand, but it's not about us alone uh, talking about the positive angle. It's about to make people change the, their minds against the continent of Africa. I think it's a matter of communication. And I think, the, I think there are two types of people in this world. People who have never been to Africa and Africa lovers. And I think, I think what we need to do is we need to make people to take their first trip to Africa, no matter where they go, because they come back with such a rich experience that they tell your story and they bring out the love for Africa. And it's not an accident I call it Mama Africa. Every time I come to, I come to Africa, this is what, what comes out. And I, but but I, think, I think at some stage, African nations and those of you in power, you really need to bring together all the resources and all the efforts to actually communicate this beauty and communicate all the good things that you're doing and all this experience that you that you've professor, got. Professor, it's not about us communicating. It's people want to communicate on our behalf. We are communicating. Yeah. We are doing everything to communicate what is right. But I think some uh, or the world agenda wants to communicate a different agenda for the continent of Africa. And this is the stigma we want, we must remove. How do we remove? Can we remove it ourselves as Africans? Or do we just find an alternative ways of, 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 of removing this stigma? I think the problem is stigma. It's not about us failing to communicate. It's stigma. And, and, and you correctly said anybody coming to the continent of Africa gets the bag of Africa. They don't want to go back. Yep. They want to stay yep. here. Look, when we locked down, when we locked down Kenya, yeah? And, and, and then slowly we opened up. More than 60% of the people who came, international people who came to, 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 to Kenya, are people who want to run away from their countries and come into Kenya and stay here and avoid the, the, the pandemic in Europe or in America. Yeah, so, so, so yes, Fantastic. it was safer, Let's... safer heaven, uh, during the pandemic. And the continent of Africa, because of the weather, because of nature, because of openness, yeah, well, this is the safer place to be uh, during this pandemic. Let's bring Claire in to uh, see her perspective from Rwanda. I think at least you've got on this panel, you've got two African lovers. I can see Marcus uh, 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 agreeing with you. And, you know, I've been a, a good ambassador for Africa for a long time. Claire, how do you see yourself from Rwanda and your experience? How Africa can actually bring this message out? And how can we use uh, marketing to rebrand Africa? 
Uh, thank you very much, Dimitrios. And uh, I'm very delighted to join this discussion. So I am the CEO of the Rwanda Development Board. Our job is to promote private sector and tourism. So I'm also in charge of tourism in Rwanda. And uh, for us, branding has been everything about what we try to do for tourism. And uh, Minister Balala was very right uh, about Africa not being homogeneous and uh, trying to also, but Africa is seen as if it's homogeneous. So um, very important that we collectively work at addressing the perception of the African continent as countries, because even though we're not homogeneous, many times we are seen as if we are one and that becomes something that really affects us. Now for Rwanda, we have a history of the genocide against the Tutsis, which we're actually commemorating this week. And for a long time, Rwanda was seen as the country that had a genocide against the Tutsis. So for us to rebrand and market Rwanda, we had to think very differently and also in a very bold way. And we put in so many um, reforms and initiatives that are very different. For example, we put uh, we advertised with Arsenal and PSG. And if you watch an Arsenal game in the Premier League today, or if you watch PSG playing, you will see uh, Visit Rwanda uh, on the sleeves of their shirts or on the back of their shirts or even in the stadium. And when we did that, the world was very shocked about a country like Rwanda promoting tourism in a Premier League football uh, club. But even though it sounded controversial and unusual, it brought a lot of branding capital on Rwanda. And we had a lot of people coming to Rwanda just to be curious. This country that was able to advertise on, um, on Arsenal, we want to visit. The first year of advertising with Arsenal, we, ha we had a 17% growth of tourism. And we did a survey together with the Arsenal Football Club and even PSG and the likelihood of people visiting Rwanda because of seeing Rwanda in these platforms was very important. So that's uh, an example of some of the bold initiatives we took to brand Rwanda and also to um, make ourselves known globally. But for us, the second point I want to make is that what makes us really um, a good brand is the experience. Because when tourists come to Rwanda, they talk about the experience. Uh, recently, we had on CNN, uh, Richard Quest, um, some of you who watched uh, uh, um, uh, CNN, when he came to Rwanda just a few weeks ago, he said that it exceeded his expectations. Now, our goal is to make sure that when people come to Rwanda, we exceed the expectations. They find a country that is physically very clean, no litter on the streets. They find a country that has infrastructure that works. They find an experience in tourism national parks that is really a, a very exceptional experience. That actually is the real brand, the experience that we have. And we really invest a lot of money in making sure that the experience speaks for itself. And then maybe the last point I want to talk about is partnerships. If you want to brand and market, you can't rely on just the tourism board doing that. For us, we've partnered, for example, with Qatar Airways to bring travel to Rwanda, between Rwanda and Qatar Airways. It's a joint venture we've, si we've signed. We also partnered with uh, lodges like uh, Wilderness Safari, Singita, who on their own do a lot of marketing. So bringing companies to invest in Rwanda, bring their FDI here, and then they become part of the partners of uh, marketing. It has been crucially important in promoting tourism for us. Thank you. Abs absolutely. That's fantastic. And, and it's really, really critical that we do not confuse marketing and promotion. Because marketing is all about bringing everything together. And I think there are so many wonderful stories that are coming out of Africa that they will reach the world. So I will deeply encourage you to involve the young people that they're going around with their mobiles, taking pictures of everyday life and how wonderful everything is in, in different neighborhoods and, and, and spread these images. Uh, because this is the authentic kind of, uh, the authentic kind of uh, Africa that we would like to experience and, and social think, media is possible absolutely absolutely yeah. and it's absolutely you know and 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 it's very cost effective so it doesn't you don't necessarily need to um to invest huge amount of money on on different things but to bring out the wonderful experience and i know that Cuthbert uh, uh shares that because we have discussed that in 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 different forums but i really want uh Cuthbert to tell us how is the African Tourist Board coming forward and how are you engaging different people uh, from around Africa to bring this message out and, and provide uh, the new kind of image of Africa? Out? You need to unmute. Right. Thank you. That's fine. No, thank you so much, Prof. It's, uh, it's a blessing to see you once again with my honorable minister, it's so good to see you. You still look younger almost every time when we get together. 
And uh, Clara, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to meet with you physically uh, during your conference. Uh, that is actually around the corner. And uh, Professor Lee, thank you so much. It's good to see you. Yes, as African Tourism Board, uh, we will always say traveling tourism sector. It is the only development as on the principles of sustainable economic activity that should be a stimulating factor of growth through collaborations. If there was a time to appropriate policy development that drives and addresses in a holistical way, present the continent as a block, it is now. Continental integration and cooperation is the core and vital for a sustainable development of the tourism economies in Africa. I so much allude with the Honorable Minister what he has indicated that uh, it's been long when somebody has been writing our own history. It has been long that somebody who does not even uh, reside in Africa, he presents our image in Africa. Imagine, Prof. If all the member states, 54 member states, if we could shout with one voice simultaneously, we are talking of rebranding our lovely continent. There is power in unity. So therefore, we have so much to achieve I mean, collectively as a block, yet so fragmented in our approach towards building a sustainable, solid economic power based in Africa. I still believe that Africa owes so much, so much to the global community, yet our people, they are still living in poverty. So we, we need a continental integration and cooperation. And by the way, we don't need conferences that do not yield uh, practical and tangible results in the recovery and development, not only within the framework of tourism sectors, but recovery and development in Africa's economies across the spectrum. That hasn't been much of an African populace. So we will need to see a full participation and beneficiation of the economic inclusion in our continent, as much as we appreciate I mean, the inroads from Rwanda, we need to be able to pollinate among us ourselves. Let us shout with one voice in rebranding and rewriting our own narrative as Africans and sell to the world. We have so much to offer. And, and I think that's the opportunity. I absolutely agree with you. And, and Cuthbert, I've been, as you know, supporting the, Austri uh, the, the African Tourist Board for a long time. And I think during, during the pandemic, it brought leadership from all over the world and brought resources and knowledge from all over the world to actually support the continent to come out and bring all this wonderful experience and all these wonderful ideas together. Let me invite Marcus in to, in to uh, join us and share his uh, view. And because we are outsiders from Africa, but we are African lovers. So I think we, we have been uh, um, good ambassadors of uh, Africa uh, around the world. And I, I'd like to see how Marcus see from an investment opportunity, what are the conditions uh, in terms of marketing and branding that they'll facilitate investment and what will enable us to actually move forward. Marcus. Thank you, Professor. I want to clarify, um, although I sit as a chairman of the SME Business Owners Association in China, which manage 11,000 corporate members. But I'm also the CEO of Welcome China and Digital China, the largest tourism marketing agency in China. So in this topic, in this session, I want to touch on the branding. Uh, and then of course, I can answer your question on FDI. Uh, that's my profession. Um, thank you, Professor. And I'm very good to see uh, my old friend, uh, Minister Najib. I see him everywhere, a few times a year, maybe. <laughs> And then uh, good to see uh, Claire and uh, Kubot, if I pronounce your name correctly, you are all veteran. I just want to share my little knowledge on the Africa as a single destination. But let me start with um, the previous session and uh, echo on the stigma uh, that the uh, minister mentioned about the media coverage, the wrong image 
So when we think about Africa and China, we think about two pictures. The first picture we think about wildlife. The second picture we think about is the NGO raising money, showing uh, some issues in Africa. So this is wrong, especially when they talk about the previous um, minister from uh, 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 Western Cape, talk about, I think it was David, the previous minister, talk about the uh, mis preconception, misperception about this South African variant. You know, this had to be corrected in media. We need to use the power of social media, the power of media to bring broadcast to the world the correct message. But I think this has not done enough so far. More can be done because of these stereotypes, these preconceptions that we have on South, on, on Africa continent. In terms of branding, this is some of the barriers we talk about. For example, we think Africa is monotonous. We think Africa is a monoculture. We think there's a backward. We think lack of history. We think it's lack of infrastructure, so on and so forth. But it's not. Africa has so much unique selling point, diversity that is offering. So before I go on further on how we can market as a single destination, we can learn from the block of country they have done, for example, tourism year. Um, I'm sure everyone remember the Europe China tourism year 2018. I just take that as an example. My company coordinated the China Pacific tourism year 2019 for 10 countries in Africa, in China. So what's the result? We increased from 125,000 Chinese visitors to 200,000 Chinese visitors. How do you do that? So this, I will want to go back to professor before taking too much time, but those are the set the stage on how can be improved as a single destination, as an Africa destination, Africa continent, how we market as a single destination. Back to you, professor. Thank you very much. That's that's absolutely wonderful. I think we've done the first round. Let me actually put a proposal into the table that I just uh, I was just thinking while you were all talking, uh, and uh, Minister and Cuthbert and Claire probably can take that forward uh, in in a very easy way. I would like to see a competition on a hashtag Love Africa, and I like you Love Africa. Hashtag Love Africa and can be on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever you, you guys are using. Uh, but I would like your young population, the students from, uh, from school, the students from university, to come up and express all the beauty of Africa and express all these wonderful resources and express all this uh, wonderful experience that you can have in Africa. And that is, uh, Minister, I think that is going to take away the stigma in a way that, you know, whoever uh, is, is not moving the image forward, we will have to look into the realities and we can, we can see the wonderful scenes that, you know, every time I come to Ghana or, or to Kenya or South Africa, the music, the people that the street food, all these wonderful things. And I'll tell you a little story. Some years ago, I came to Ghana and I met one of my ex students. And she wanted to take me to a very nice uh, international restaurant. And I said, no, 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 let's walk around the neighborhood. And we went to some very little, uh, nice little restaurant where the locals, they welcome us in the, in the best amazing way. And I was taking pictures and, and this um, ex-student of mine, who is a wonderful lady, and she represents Africa everywhere, told me, look, Professor, you taught me a, uh, a new lesson. And the lesson is go bottom up, see what's happening in the neighborhood, bring the people into the authentic experiences and tell the story. And I think, I think a competition of video, a competition of photography may actually do that cost effectively and populate the world with hashtag Love Africa. And I think that will be one of the best ways of coming forward. I know that Alicia is going to come back in a minute and she is going to tell me that we need to, uh, to hurry up. But I'd like to give you one minute each to come back with 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 a second uh, a second position and actually see how we can take uh, all these innovative marketing and branding techniques that we see around the world and how can we bring the right image and the right brand out of Africa, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, first of all, a quick one. I want to appreciate Professor Lee 
uh, I want to call you Marcos. That's the name I am used to it. Uh, Marcos, uh, you, you, are, you are spot on. Stereotypes is what is killing our efforts. Rwanda is doing well, but imagine the stereotype, genocide. Yeah, again, just the other day we had Ebola. Ebola is in West Africa. South Africa suffered because of the stereotype. You know, it is conveniently you say it's homogeneous and then conveniently you say it's not homogeneous. Yeah, so those are the challenges we are facing. But with the new technological uh, dispensation, the social media, the agenda is changing. Yeah, I agree with you, Professor, is that the young people now are taking the story out themselves. They are not waiting for government. They are not waiting for the mainstream media. They are going against the mainstream media. I can tell you one time CNN, when pre President Obama came to Kenya, yeah, CNN said, hotbed eh, of terrorism is Kenya. Immediately, Kenyans and young people in the social media and the rest of the world actually refuted this Kenya is not a hotbed for terrorism. And President Obama came, and many other presidents came to Kenya, and it is a safe destination. We get incidents. We get incidents like any part of the world. I have seen the statistics in the United States of the pandemic currently, and I have seen statistics of crime happening on a daily basis. But the international media would not report those crimes because those are local news. They want international news. So anything happens negative in Africa becomes news, but anything positive is being run down. And I agree with Claire. When these people come in here, like Richard Quest came to, 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 to Rwanda, and he came to Kenya two years ago, and it is mind boggling. They can't believe they have discovered a new destination or a new world altogether when they come to the continent of Africa. So, so branding is, is, is the right thing to do. But again, we need to push hard. The narrative chairman is talking about, yeah? We are writing new narratives, but it is not reaching out because it's being suffocated, yeah? Because remember, we are in competition. We are not an island of our own in the continent of Africa. We are in competition with Europe. We are in competition with China. We are in competition with America. We are in competition with Southeast Asia. So everybody is competing. And now with this pandemic, the lessons is that you cannot travel overseas. So what you do is travel locally. So everybody have realized there is a domestic product and a domestic market and from the domestic market, you can at least not replace the revenue lost from international travel. And that's why all of us, we are looking at domestic tourism currently, because the, uh, the world is, is, closed, is closed down. I can tell you for us, uh, we, we are technologically uh, savvy as our young generation in the continent of Africa, not only, not only in Kenya. The continent of Africa, the young population are moving their agendas. It's not government anymore. It's not the media anymore. It is them. And that is the spirit we want to proceed in changing the narrative for brand Africa. Absolutely. And that, is, and that is the hope for Africa, to bring all this young population, because you have the youngest population. And you are actually using technology very effectively because it's all on smartphones to actually bring the positive message out. And if there's anybody who is not uh, listening, they'll be forced to listen because they'll see it everywhere. Love, hashtag love Africa. That's, that's the bit I, I like to bring forward. Claire, would you like to have your one minute, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And just to build on again, what Minister Balala um, and my colleagues, uh, Cuthbert and Lee, uh, Mr. Lee talked about earlier. I think the best way to really tackle this brand issue is to have more and more people exposed to the truth about what our countries are, have to offer. I gave the example of Richard Quest, Mr. Balala did the same for Kenya and many others. We bring journalists, we bring two operators and we, we bring them on familiar, fam, familiarization trips for free. They come to the country, we pay for everything, and we tell them, just see, you know, we, we're not telling you to view us in a different room, just experience Rwanda. 
and then you go out there with what you see. And we've seen that really makes a very big difference. And we've also um, uh, organized conferences. And one way we've seen that is very easy to get uh, people to see the countries organizing conferences. So we work with the UN, we've, we've built a convention center. People come here for meetings and then they realize there's a lot more than just attending a meeting in the country. And they discover things that they would never expect in a country like ours. For example, did you know that uh, the World Economic Forum and many others rank Rwanda among the 10 safest destinations in the world, not in Africa, not in a certain section of the world, but in the world. Nobody would expect that an African country would rank top 10 in the world, safer than many other developed countries. But this is something that we need to really get out there and really get people exposed to. The last point that I want to talk about in terms of um, working together, we should look at the example we have within the East African community and Minister Balala would know this. We have uh, this single destination marketing that we do. When we go to um, ITM or when we go to uh, WTM in London, we have our section where we do trade fairs. As East Africa, it's Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Rwanda. And we really promote our country as a destination. And I think building on this, we can do this for the African continent if we got all the places uh, and pieces together. Thank you. Thank you very much. All those are very effective marketing techniques. And I think the more you collaborate, the better it will bring out the message and we will we, we take everything forward. Cuthbert, um, would you like to share your plans with the um, African Tourist Board and how you can facilitate uh, some of these activities? You need to unmute. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Prof. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, the Honorable Minister has indicated that, uh, look, we also need to look uh, within. That is focusing on your domestic, on your regional, and your, on your continental uh, segment market, which has been actually uh, been ignored for some time. I have said I had a meeting in there when I went to, uh, to Cote d'Ivoire, where we realized that our, our tourism sector, this also falls under branding, was structured in such a way that it does not include your domestic uh, travelers. It only included your international travelers who come from abroad. And you, 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 you tend to ignore your local market, who actually plays a critical role. Imagine, as I indicated, that if, if each and every member state, we can shout with one voice and training all our citizens to be brand ambassadors of selling our destination. So in the process of saying Africa is ready to actively participate within the global space framework, we really need to address some fundamental issues that impacts our progress. I was so disappointed, especially when you talk of connectivity, that is not structured to your local, uh, I mean, uh, travelers. It's only structured to some guys coming from abroad, whereby we have challenges. And uh, my honorable, if I could be a little bit harsh as, as the policymaker, you represent us so that we can drive these uh, progressive uh, engagements to the right decision makers connectivity in Africa, which still remains a challenge. So we, we, we need to make sure that we integrate our, our, our efforts together. I am glad that uh, uh, Claire, he's, she's actually, I've been following the progresses of Rwanda. We need to be able to pollinate among us, ourselves as member states. Let us learn from our neighbors. Let's stop the, the, the segmentation so that we work towards the objective of bringing Africa within the global playing fields. The ground is not level. So it's high time that we bring all member states together and shout with one voice. Africa, yes, we are ready. We have so much to offer. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Uh, Marcus, your last word, please. Uh, and how we can help Africa to flourish. Yeah, my last word for this session, yes. Um, yes. <laughs> China bring a few millions, more than a million uh, uh, tourists to Africa continent. Uh, we increased about 40% in the past five years, pre-COVID, of course. Uh, I want to set the stage. Many younger generations go there, 
families goes there, uh, females more than male going there. Younger generation, I mean, both those are born after 70, those are born after 80, take about 62%, well, including myself. So how I buy uh, the packages, how I choose destination, actually, I'm part of the group. So I have a few, just a few um, conclusions to make from my side, from the Chinese perspective is number one, understanding the appeal of individual destination. Number two, understanding the, the shift of the market trends. Um, everyone knows about um, moving from group to FIT, especially China right now, from group to custom made. And number third point is um, enhance the B2B marketing even right now, uh, for example, do e-learning. Um, this is the best time. Don't wait for, for the gate to open and everyone move to do marketing. So now is the time, not when you got uh, enough budget or now not when the border is open, not that. And the fourth point is B2C. Social media, don't belong to, don't go back to the old school, not just below, not just take Facebook, Twitter. That's not enough. My company managed like 30 platforms. I mean, WeChat, we, Weibo is no longer enough. You have to keep in the trend with the niche marketing, for example, female marketing, knowledge marketing, certain target group. And my last point is about how China ready is your de destination. I'm a big advocate about China ready. For example, I go to South Africa every year and then I keep on telling every, every year to them and still, there's still so much to improve on China readiness. So I want to conclude with one last point is how can we market Africa as a single destination? I have one idea is to launch the Visit Africa 2025 or to launch the China Africa Tourism Year 2025. This is one single largest marketing campaign that can unite the entire African continent and market as one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. I think, I think you've got a lot of good ideas that they're all packaged together. Okay. And I think if we kind of bring all this knowledge and this expertise together, will have wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful results. It needs to be cost effective. It needs to be quick. And now is the time. I really, I think Cuthbert said that now is the time. It's, it's all to bring all the wonderful power and all the wonderful energy that's coming out of, out of uh, Africa. Thank you very much. I think we can, we can talk for another three hours, but uh, my friend Ibrahim and Alicia would not like us to do so. But hopefully we'll have the opportunity to meet in person sometime very soon. And we will be able to take some of these things forward offline and different forums. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Paul Hoskins. I'm a director of the ITIC company and Invest Tourism, and it's my pleasure to moderate uh, this next this session, uh, which is all about the investment opportunities uh, in the African area. And we're joined today by uh, Monsieur Guillaume Pellerin, who's the chief executive officer of Zoobox, uh, specializing in uh, the development of eco lodges. Uh, Frederick Robert from Mauritius, who has a very exciting uh, project uh, uh, for, for the country there. Uh, also, Mr. John Pinniger of the Association for International Travel and Tourism. And uh, John also has particular interests in the West African uh, area countries. And a little bit later, we'll be joined by Dr. Diamana, who is the, uh, has a tourism project which he's going to tell us about mm -hmm. for Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, so let's get straight on with the first presentation and over to you, Guillaume. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Paul. Mm. Um, can we confirm first that the presentation is online? Oh, great. It is. Good. Um, so as Paul um, you know, uh, said, I, I'm, my name is Guillaume Pellerin. I'm the CEO for Zoobox. Uh, uh, so Zoobox is an ecotourism company. We design, construct, and operate ecotourism sites uh, around the world. Now, um, we are trying to develop a new kind of ecotourism. So our definition of ecotourism would be a tourism that has very low or no impact on its host environment. Uh, and we are trying to create what we call a regeneration tourism. So it's tourism that actually helps regenerate its local environment. Uh, we work with national parks, uh, but we also work with forestry organization and we work with private investors as well. Um, so maybe we can get to the next slide. To tell you just a bit of story of Zoobox. So we've been in operation for 15 years, mainly in Canada. We started near a national park called Offord National Park, south of Montreal. Uh, now we're opening sites around the world, uh, so through two more sites in Canada, sites in England, in Ireland, Portugal, but also in Africa, uh, and that's what I want to talk about, in Madagascar uh, and in the Ivory Coast. Now, uh, the Ivory Coast project has been put a bit on ice uh, due to COVID, but Madagascar is progressing well, so I can talk to you a bit more about how we... Uh, we're proceeding there. We can change slide, please. So those are the projects that we're on right now. Uh, we also have a memorandum with Saudi Arabia for five sites. Um, we can change the uh, slide. Again. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so Zoobox, whenever we create a site, there's three main pillars. There's a natural nature immersion. So when you're on a zoo box site, you should not see or hear your neighbor. The whole idea is to be in nature. Uh, you know, 80% of the population live in cities now. We've been stuck on each other with COVID. Uh, so a lot of people just want to connect back to nature and, and be with their loved one, you know, in their own kind of little bubble. Um, there's always an imaginative journey site. So what we do is we take normal ecotourism experiences. A good example would be, let's say, fat bike. And then we try to push it further. So we would do fat bike at night with luminescence tired. And we would uh, create a whole storyline with your friends uh, where you would have to do some activities to unlock some quests. So we try to you know, go a bit further. And the third and most important one for national park is ecosystem protection. So there's always a, a, a study to have the least possible impact on the environment when we uh, construct. And then there's a regeneration program after that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of nature immersion. So the zoo box unit, the technology is actually in the center. You see the box in the center. And the outside appearance in this case is made to mimic uh, the desert dunes because that's the local environment. But when you have forest, you have a different type of, of cladding. Uh, when you have a jungle, it's different. Uh, so it really depends on where we're doing the project. Uh, next slide, please. So the Zoobox technology was made for a national park. 
the idea is that you can install it with no roads, no heavy equipment, and completely off the grid. And the house itself can be splitted in, in small pieces. So in countries like Madagascar, for example, we could carry the whole thing by hands, by people carrying pieces of the house and reassemble it uh, on site, uh, which gives us almost no impact on the park. That's usually a big struggle that you have with National Park, where you just cannot build any infrastructure. Uh, so that's the that's solution we bring. Uh, next slide, please. So that's an example of imaginative journey. We work with different partners, but we, we do outdoor activities, but also artwork uh, at night. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, so there's three pillars for our uh, ecotourism side. All our sites are carbon negative for construction and operation. Then we have our ecosystem regeneration program, which can generate up to 100K per year uh, in, in direct uh, ecosystem regeneration uh, protection program. And our sites are zero waste, so the kitchen doesn't produce any waste. Uh, next site, next, next uh, slide. So when we work with national parks, we try to use ecotourism as a regional development tool, regeneration tool, and we have a program to transfer all the infrastructure to the national park uh, over a period of time with training. So we help countries that have not developed yet their infrastructure for park, and we transfer those infrastructure over time uh, so it then become an official national park and the project can be part of that. Um, and I think we're to the, 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 the last slide. Yeah, that's it. So that's good. It was uh, a bit over five minutes, <laughs> but that's what we do. So if uh, anybody's interested to work with us in Africa, uh, we're in Madagascar and Ivory Coast, but we would be happy to work in other countries. Uh, so you can go on our website, www.zoobox.ie. Uh, you'll find my number and my email address there. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, uh, Guillaume. The, just for interest sake, uh, as this is also a quest for investment uh, in, as part of our discussions today, uh, you talked a little bit about the Madagascar project um, being live. Is that uh, how many millions of dollars are you, is so involved in if, that? If we're talking about Madagascar, it's a project of, of high-end lodges. Um, the, um, the project is 25 lodges a welcoming center and a scientific station. The total cost is about 17 million at the moment with a small airport uh, because it's high end uh, and it's quite isolated. All right. um, we're looking at a return of investment of about five to six years, depending on the occupancy rate. We already have two investors that are ready uh, and we might be looking for a third investor. So a third investor could be for 30% of the project, for example. Yeah, uh, so many, if anybody's interested, I would be happy to talk with them. Indeed. And how, how many units and whereabouts in Madagascar is this? Taken? So if you know Madagascar, in the middle of the island, there's a, 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 a place that is not known internationally, but known by locals called the Makai. Uh, uh, and the Makai is this... Uh, it, it's almost like rediscovering the, the Galapagos Island. It, it's unexplored, uh, very rare uh, endemic uh, species. And it's, it's this series of canyon with natural pools uh, and, and species that are just unknown at the moment. Uh, so it's really a stunning place. And the idea is to build the project on top of the canyons. So you would have this big open view on the canyon and the Mackay itself, which is a, a huge valley. Uh, also a series of rivers uh, within the, 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 the canyon. So it's, a, it's really a stunning place and it's not known yet. Uh, so we want to develop a park with the local government uh, before it gets known uh, because we don't want this stunning place to be damaged uh, by tourism. And, and you have a timeline on this? Uh, obviously, it depends it, on the investment. You know, it, it all depends on, on, on permits. That's, you know, construction is never really the issue for us. It's the permit, especially for a national park. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to launch it within the next two years. Um, but that's going to depend on, on uh, whether we get the permit soon, uh, sooner or later. That's great. Well, thank you very much indeed. It sounds really exciting and uh, a, a very much an undiscovered or and still to be discovered destination in Madagascar.
So now we move to a country with another M, Mauritius, and it's my pleasure to introduce Frederick Robert, who's going to tell us about uh, his exciting development opportunities for a 21st city, a century city, uh, called St. Felix. Um, Frederick, over to you. Good afternoon, Paul. Thank you. Um, there is a little um, presentation of uh, one of the main features of a project, if that could be played, and then I'll run you through the whole development. Okay, so this was just a feature of a project. It's a smart city um, development in Mauritius. So government, um, point one, government introduced a new real estate scheme a few years back to boost investment in that sector. So this scheme was introduced in 2015 with several incentives. Uh, a developer can, uh, can um, um, do a project and be exempted from income tax for a period of eight years, ex exempted on land transfer tax, registration duties, exempted on custom duties, on construction materials, and VAT recovery on building and capital goods also granted accelerated annual allowance at the rate of 50% on capital expenditure for certain equipment. So the government put a, a scheme to encourage um, promoters and investors to come to Mauritius. Also, a, a very interesting point is that non-citizen or any legal structure can acquire a built-up residential property without a minimum price for an acquisition of a residential unit, but with an amount exceeding um, 375,000 USD, a non-citizen can apply with his family uh, for residence permit. There are also inter interesting schemes for retirees coming to settle to Mauritius. So point two, so the master plan project is divided into several phases and is situated in the southwest region of Mauritius. So if we're going to go to point two of the slide, please, Alicia. Yeah, here we go. So the master plan has been divided into seven phases and enabling each phase to fully achieve their development targets and to benefit all tax exemptions mentioned over a period of eight years. The project is surrounded by existing villages and the region counts around 60,000 people living in the, its vicinity. The smart city has signed a strategic agreement with a Japanese company for ocean-based research and development technologies, also known as OTEC. The whole project cost is capped at 2.5 billion USD over a period of, of 20 years. Point three, so it's phase one. We'll start, so the phase one is wake, work, live, and play criteria. The phase one development includes the main, the main infrastructural works of the project. It is divided into residential zones, offices, and recreational activities. The various zones can be developed by different promoters within the smart city project, and thus opening opportunities in terms of concept and design. People today are looking for small and spacious housing units with a garden which they can easily attend to. The chance of the smart city is that it can combine different layers of society, thus creating the soul of the city where people can interact, exchange ideas, contribute towards upgrading our environment, performing sport activities easily, 
and helping others in need by joining the Smart City community platform, which will be open to the region at large. The concept of living into such a development is to bring all facilities to your doorsteps, thus avoiding transportation, stress, fatigue, and giving you a quality of life where you can work and enjoy fully your leisure time. The phase one development cost is capped at 170 million USD over a period of eight years. So point four. So sustainable development goals voted by the UN is fully integrated in the project. The success of a smart city development will greatly depend upon the implementation at the project level of these sustainable points as illustrated. The site is located between the mountain at the back and the sea in front. The site has natural resources such as fresh water flowing through, wind coming from the southeast, a solar exposure to the north, and the ocean in front. All these factors could be transformed into sustainable energy, thus reducing the carbon footprint and improving the standard of living. Agricultural zones has, have been earmarked to supply the smart city and common gardens of fruit and vegetables cultivated by actors of the smart city and distributed locally. A major aspect is to include the people of a region, a fisherman village, which you saw on the last plan, into educative programs to preserve their lagoon and environment and derive an income from these activities. Social integration, accessibility to sports, to maintain the healthy body and mind are primordial for the community. Urban planning combined with sustainable construction methods with a plan of trop tropical reforestation. Point five, closing statement. So the company, uh, you, you see the, villain, uh, the fisherman village the background here. So um, the company dates back as from 1914 and has actively participated in the development of its region and its people. We strongly believe that the success of a smart city is linked to the well-being of all stakeholders, poverty alleviation and integration within the development. And thank you. I will be available for any questions if you wish, uh, Paul. Jan, mute. Thank you very much. Uh... Frederick, that was a really interesting development and uh, presentation. And uh, you look, this is uh, obviously a project which is going to be going over quite a few years. Yes. Um, and uh, the first phase is already underway, I imagine. And uh, you're looking to go for how, uh, for what, five years or longer? Um, the, each phase, you can go uh, to benefit all the tax incentive. It's a maximum of eight years. And the first phase, we are still in the planning um, uh, um, period now. And we hope that we can start it by the end of this year. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, your overall investment, you're looking for in excess of $100 million. So, that's, uh, so for phase one is $170 million. Um, as I mentioned, it's a mixture of work, live and play. And the whole project is very big, and we are speaking about a 2.5 billion USD project. Thank you very much indeed. I look forward to seeing how that grows and uh, comes together. I think it has a very good good possibilities, and uh, it's going to be very much uh, an environmental and self-sustaining uh, development, which is great. Yeah. These are Thank points you. which we will put forward because we believe that the community at large must be uh, fully integrated into the development of our project. Of for it to be a success, meaning local people and um, foreign people coming to live here, uh, for it to have life, we believe that we need this mix um, locally and uh, internationally. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. And uh... Thank you, Paul. We look forward to hearing how things develop over the years and uh, keeping keeping in touch with that and uh, anyone interested in taking some investment positions and please get in touch um, now we're going to welcome dr diamana from the cote d'ivoire to uh, tell us a little bit about his project and um, he's joined by joseph gra who is going to do the translation uh, so, welcome, uh, Dr. Diamana, and it's very nice to see you here on our session for investment and uh, developments. And uh, welcome, gentlemen. Perhaps uh, we can pass to you now and invite you to uh, tell us about uh, your your investment opportunity in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Yeah. 
need to unmute yourself, yeah. Merci beaucoup. Je salue tous ceux qui sont sur la plateforme. Thank you very much. Uh, my greetings goes to all the panelists. Et je ne saurais présenter le projet sans localiser la Côte d'Ivoire d'abord pour qu'il soit mieux su. Uh, I could not present, uh, carry out my presentation without presenting Avricos for all of you guys to know where Avricos is located. Et la Côte d'Ivoire est un magnifique pays situé en Afrique de l'Ouest, dans le golfe de Guinée. Côte d'Ivoire is a very beautiful country located in the uh, Gulf of Guinea. Frontalier au Burkina, le Mali va le nord. And bordered, by, bordered by Mali and Burkina in the north. Uh, Liberia at west and Li Ghana at south. Liberia in west and Ghana east. C'est un joyeux de 322,462 km carré. It's a, it's a country that um, is large at 322,462 and 1,462 square meter. Et sa population est estimée à près de 23 millions 200 000 habitants. Population is estimated around two, I mean, 23 millions. Yeah. Thank you for the, the slides. Dans son approche de développement, le, président, le premier président a placé la capitale à Yamsoko. Il s'est la capitale politique et Abidjan la capitale économique. So we have the... Um, Um, political capital in Yamsukro Abidjan is the economic capital. Cette nation comporte 30, 31 grandes régions qui sont des pôles d'attraction. So the, 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 the country um, is divided into um, 31 regions. Et donc uh, le PIB de la Côte d'Ivoire est de 49,4 milliards. C'est le PIB soit près de 29, 000, 20, 29 300 milliards de francs CFA, la Côte d'Ivoire confirme son statut de première économie de deux mois. Le yeah, GDP uh, est... Um, yeah, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, with a GDP of uh, uh, 49.4 billion, yeah, and uh, it's the leading... Economy in the West Africa. La Côte d'Ivoire est essentielle en Afrique de l'Ouest et occupe la douzième place au niveau du classement de la Banque mondiale. Yeah, it's the 12, um, it's ranking 12 uh, by, by the World Bank as a you know, richest African country. Au deuxième classement de Doing Business, il a été ici au 110e rang euh, mondial sur 190 pays. Yeah, doing business is ranking Avricos on the 110th um, out of, you know, 190 countries. Le cacao qui engendre le chocolat, notre pays est l'un des premiers producteurs dans le monde. So, you know, leading cocoa producer in the world as well. Alors, au niveau de l'EVA, nous avons du grand potentiel. Nous sommes quatrième mondial. I mean, fourth uh, producer in, on, on rubber in the world. Mais ce qui est essentiel que vous devez découvrir, c'est que la Côte d'Ivoire compte 520 km de côte bordant l'océan Atlantique. Yeah, Côte d'Ivoire a 520 km coastal uh, bordering uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. La Côte d'Ivoire est une immense bénédiction naturelle avec ses plages au sable fin, des cocotiers, des scrits, des falaises, des lagunes permettant la baignade et qui est un épanouissement total pour tout touriste qui découvre l'Afrique. And it has some marvelous uh, places like fine standing beaches, uh, coconut palms, uh, creeks, creek cliffs, lagoon for swimming, and so forth. Uh, Avri Coast is a, a very uh, beautiful country for any um, foreigner visiting the country. Ce qui permettra aux touristes de faire de suivre des pêches. Et je veux dire, so, um, they, it's also helps, you know, doing surfing, uh, fishing sport and whatever, and also fishing, yeah, what is. Nous avons des potentialités comme Grand Bassam, qui sont des buts touristiques, Assini, Sassandra et San Pedro, qui sont les principales destinations touristiques euh, enviées par les autres pays euh, euh, environnant la Côte d'Ivoire. Africa do have, you know, 
towns like Grand Bassa, Massini, Sosandra, and San Pedro that are, you know, the main seaside tourist destination and that are mostly um, appreciated. Je voudrais dire à tous les professionnels du tourisme que la Côte d'Ivoire est une opportunité touristique dont les segments vont être présentés maintenant, dont la baie des milliardaires. Hein? Je disais que la Côte d'Ivoire est une opportunité touristique pour tous les sachants, les professionnels du tourisme, dont nous allons présenter quelques segments les plus importants dans la baie des milliardaires, qui est donc, qui jonge juste à Bidjan et qui a une étendue de plane d'eau inestimable. So, one of the main tourist uh, destination uh, and opportunity is the, the Billionaire Bay, Bay that is uh, uh, in, the, in the outskirts of Abidjan um, and that have a beautiful landscape. Alors, les images d'opérateurs économiques dans le domaine touristique qui montrent là déjà des sites qui sont occupés, qui attirent des millions et des millions de personnes, de touristes euh, en Côte d'Ivoire chaque année. So, the below are uh, images showing the existing tourist infrastructure, hotels in, in Abidjan Bay, uh, Billionaire Bay, that are drawing in the country thousands of tourists uh, every year. Cette eau que vous voyez, c'est l'océan Atlantique, euh, ce qui borde donc la, la baie des milliardaires. So you can also see uh, here the Atlantic Ocean that's, uh, that's, that is located in the uh, Billionaire Bay. Nous allons maintenant à San Pedro, une, une, une grande uh, ville touristique qui est une opportunité, je vais dire inestimable. Allons-y à San Pedro. So we will also have another um, um, tourist project in San Pedro, which is a uh, a beautiful city that are drawing um, very large people uh, every year. So we move to San Pedro. À San Pedro, nous avons une opportunité de 250 hectares situé à Portu de Bon Primé, qui donc en bordu se trouve encore une immense étendue d'eau. Et à San Pedro, nous avons l'opportunité de réaliser euh, euh, sur cette superficie de 250 hectares, je veux dire une cité touristique qui serait très attrayante à quelques encabus du nouveau stade que l'État de Côte d'Ivoire a été de réaliser en prélude de la, CAD, euh, la Coupe d'Afrique des Nations. Yeah, in San Pedro, we do have a project uh, that, is, that we are planning to implement uh, on uh, 350 hectares uh, in Pont Brimé, which has a very beautiful river and, uh, in the place, and which is close to the... Um, It's located in this, I mean, um, next to the Olympic Stadium that is being built for the next uh, African uh, Nation Cup. Ce projet donc que nous allons réaliser en collaboration avec le Conseil africain du tourisme, c'est un challenge pour relever le tourisme. C'est un challenge, c'est un avantage inestimable qui va attirer beaucoup de touristes en Afrique et singulièrement en Côte d'Ivoire. Um, it's going to be a, 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 a challenge for uh, um, for us to do it because we're going to do it in collaboration with the African Tourism Board that we um, that we hope will will help us to implement this project for the goods of Africans. Je veux dire les bordures d'eau, les plages existantes sont déjà une opportunité inestimable et nous souhaitons réaliser ce projet là et je pense que la volonté de du Conseil africain du tourisme d'accompagner ce projet et est un avantage immense. Nous souhaitons le réaliser pour relever le tourisme en Côte d'Ivoire. So we wishing to implement this project in collaboration with the African Tourism Board uh, because it's a, a, a location. The location is where well, it's well situated and next to the to the sea uh, and also the river. So which is uh, good for um, relaunching and uplifting the tourism industry in Côte d'Ivoire. La Côte d'Ivoire était toujours une destination touristique prisée et nous souhaitons boucler cette opération. So, uh, Côte d'Ivoire has ever been uh, a tourist destination, so we believe to implement this project and uh, help uh, also this uh, image to, to stand. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, 
And uh, do you have an estimate for your investment uh, that you're looking for? Edmond, si tu as une estimation du montant que tu cherches pour pouvoir investir dans ce, dans ce projet. Oui, nous avons confié un cabinet d'études. Mm -hmm. We have um, engaged uh, a, in a, a, I mean, a company, a specialist company. Qui est déjà en train de travailler sur les le droits de pulse au Tunis. That are working on the uh, rights of the, um, the locals. Jusqu'à à, l'obtention de la CD pour la réalisation du projet, on va communiquer. Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, for your presentation and, and for joining us. Finalize the paperwork for, 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 for the implementation of this. Excellent. Well, we look forward to learning more about uh, this exciting development. Uh, it looks absolutely superb and uh, it's been extremely interesting to our audience to, uh, to learn about uh, the Cote d'Ivoire and the opportunities and uh, investment uh, opportunities there. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm now going to move to our next uh, colleague, uh, Mr. John Pinniger. Uh, John and I have known each other now for a number of years uh, through the Skoll International Tourism Association and uh, the development of a business-oriented organization which John founded some three, four years ago called the Association for International Travel and Tourism. Uh, John, welcome to our investment opportunities session. Um, you're working on a number of projects and developments, uh, especially for Africa, but at the moment I know you've got a few of the West African things. Tell us a little bit about uh, your aims and objectives for the AITT and uh, and also your interests uh, in the region. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to follow a uh, gentleman from uh, Côte d'Ivoire. Um, I'd like to assure him that uh, at AITT, uh, most of our directors uh, speak both English and French, including myself. And uh, one of the things that I want to uh, emphasize today is the importance of recognizing language differences across Africa. Uh, only yesterday I discovered that, um, in fact, contrary to my um, previous thinking, uh, most countries in, or the largest number of countries in Africa actually speak French. Uh, the second largest number speak English, and um, five speak Portuguese, uh, two speak Arabic, and one speaks Spanish. And I think that's important to emphasize the differences and variations across Africa, which is why I find it difficult to see Africa as a single destination. And I think it's uh, in terms of what we're doing uh, ourselves at the Association for International Travel and Tourism, uh, we have directors for each uh, region of Africa, and we're also appointing country managers for each of the uh, countries within those regions. Uh, in order to coordinate uh, both the promotion of tourism and investment into tourism. And uh, so I think uh, it would be good to say that um, the association is a not-for-profit organization. It was set up three years ago. Uh, we work, um, we, we have uh, 25 directors and managers and expert advisors uh, all over the world. Um, we have directors in India, in Canada, in Eastern Europe, in Russia, and uh, we have four in Africa, four directors in Africa, to recognize the differences uh, that uh, exist, uh, not just in language, but in terms of culture and in terms of uh, environment and culture and heritage. And we're, we, I'm very pleased to say that we're just about to start work with the World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage, which I know wants to work with AITT in developing uh, culture and heritage tourism in Africa as a whole. It's very uh, interesting. Uh, John, could I just uh, yeah. interrupt? Um, it might be interesting for our, our colleagues uh, if you could just 
summarize a few of those uh, items which you've discussed in in French. Would you like to do that? Uh, si, si vous voulez que je parle en français, je, je peux. <laughs> c'est c'est pas un problème. Uh, J'ai le plaisir de travailler avec, uh, par exemple, le, le Togo, uh, la Guinée, uh, le Sénégal. Uh, je serais très content de travailler aussi avec la Côte d'Ivoire, si ça c'est possible. Et uh, je peux vous dire que notre directrice de relations publiques c'est une ivoirienne, donc euh, je suis très content de vous dire ça. Et, et euh, comme je, euh, j ai, j ai, je pense euh, surtout qu'il faut euh, promouvoir euh, dans les pays anglophones, il faut promouvoir les pays francophones en Afrique, parce que je pense que il y a un manque de, de comment dire, de, connex, de connectivité. Je, je pense que les Anglais, les, les Anglais, les anglophones ne sont pas conscients tellement de ce, ce qui se passe dans les pays francophones. Et ça, c'est quelque chose qu'il faut, uh, qu faut corriger, quoi. So if I can just go back to English, anyway. So. Yeah, I think, no, I thought it would be useful for our colleagues and also the, our French-speaking uh, audience to, to know that we are also able to discourse in more than just one language. John, we have very little time left. Uh, but uh, you've covered, I think, the main points of uh, the AITT and your interest. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to, to say just to yeah. those? I would just like to say, because our, our, our current um, uh, focus is on West Africa, uh, we plan to hold a West African tourism conference with your good selves at AITIC uh, in Togo uh, in 2022. It was supposed to be this year but uh, unfortunately because of the pandemic we had to delay things so we will be holding hopefully with the agreement of the minister of tourism in togo uh, a physical conference next year in lome and we will be inviting all of the countries of west africa to um, that conference and it will be held in all languages so in french in portuguese and in english um, and I think that that's uh, one of the things I would just like to finish on is to pick up on uh, the minister of, uh, from Kenya, Mr. Bulala, whose speech I heard earlier. Uh, all of his messages are absolutely right. We need to get the narrative right on Africa. We need to uh, get the European countries to understand what is really going on in Africa, and that it is not, and it is not a whole host of negative messages. Um, there are many positive things going on, particularly in West Africa, which is the one that I, the area that I deal mostly with. Uh, I'm pleased to say that I, I, I visited uh, Guinea on several occasions. I'm about to go back to Conakry, and uh, I'm very keen to develop tourism there and to bring investment in there as well. And finally, I think I would just like to emphasize that uh, one of the reasons I'm very happy working with Invest Tourism and ITIC is that I see promotion of tourism and investment in tourism going hand in hand. It's absolutely essential that we put the two together for the benefit of African tourism. Thank you very much, John, and it's a pleasure to have you with us as always. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Frederick, Guillaume, Dr. Diamana and uh, Joseph, thank you very much for your participation. And I'll now hand back to uh, our coordinator. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you.
So there we are. We come to a close. Um, what conclusions can we draw from the last two days? I think one thing that's definitely come out is that Africa needs uh, ever closer union. It needs to coordinate more in terms of uh, cross borders, in terms of connectivity, branding. Uh, I think all that came out. Um, we certainly heard that from a few of the ministers. And it sounds like that might well be the case. And ITIC may have a role in that. Um, from Dr. Heyman, uh, I, I got the idea that basically the notion that in the future, it's going to be bilateral and multilateral agreements between countries. They're going to forge uh, easier travel in the immediate future. Uh, and of course, from Gloria, we heard how coordinated protocols on vaccine certification and testing for international uh, tourism seems to be the way forward. There is a path forward. It's not going to be easy, but there is a path forward. Uh, interesting facts, interesting aspects that, that I gleaned from from yesterday and today really is that domestic tourism in Africa is kind of booming really. It's, it's really been one of the um, silver linings in, in the cloud of COVID. Uh, that's definitely on the rise and it's going to be good for the whole continent if that, if that is the future. Just talking in the uh, Raising Capital sessions, we learned, uh, and well, we didn't learn, we know this anyway, but it's, it's the fact, simple fact that investing in small businesses, SMEs, is the way forward. We need to do more of that. Uh, when um, groups like the uh, Commonwealth um, get in more involved, that's the way they're going to go. We heard about the Commonwealth Entrepreneurs Club. It wants to do that, that too. And even from the um, state governments and, and the uh, city governments of, of um, Cape Town, we heard, and Western Cape, we heard how they definitely believe in, in PPP, that, that there has to be a public-private partnership that has to help forge, again, more coordination and make uh, us, make the, the route back. Um, we also, um, I think, hope, I think we know that discerning investors see beyond media headlines because uh, we all heard uh, Najib's uh, heartfelt plea really about stigmatization of Africa and that needs to change. We need to get this narrative sorted. Um, I mean, the simple fact is, is that Africa actually has been relatively unscathed compared to the rest of the world when it comes to COVID. Um, I learned something interesting from Marcus Lee, who actually said at one point that, um, that more women than men are coming as tourists to, to China, sorry, to Africa, I beg your pardon. Uh, and that's an interesting development. And obviously, and also younger people from China. And he's suggesting a 2025 China Africa big campaign, which sounds like a, like a good thing. Um, while we wait for tourism to really get back on the road, uh, um, in terms of investment, it's infrastructure and training that are crucial. They can carry on right now. And that is a, a positive thing that everyone can, can, can do. Um, and one interesting, tiny little interesting fact I learned was that after Rwanda put sponsorship on or put their name on Arsenal football shirts, tourism to Rwanda rose by 17% from the UK is I think what I got there, which is uh, an interesting point. So um, maybe <laughs> that's the future. Um, Every African country has a football team, a premiership football team that they sponsor, but we'll, we'll see if that happens. Um, let me turn to uh, uh, our, our selected um, uh, collective people here um, to ask about your takeaways. Let me go to you first, uh, Talib Rifai. Tell me, what, what, what did you glean? What did you get from today and yesterday? A few things. Rowan is the investment part. We're more investing in infrastructure than in real estate. We're more investing in things that serve tourism and serve the community, rather than just tourism. I spent 20 years of my life in tourism. I don't care about tourism. What I care about is what it does to people. And that's what the investment is should be about. Highways, airports, ports, and all of these services. That's what's needed. Not uh, more hotels or more strictly tourism infrastructure. It's more real estate, not real estate anymore. It's infrastructure. But the second part about investment is investing in technology and in SMEs. That's something that we all emphasize because our, our industry is one about SMEs. 85% of 
about Mr. Cesar is in So we need to direct the investors into that in that area. But in, in order to get investment, that gets me to my second point. We need to restore confidence, trust. Confidence and trust can only be restored. There are two things that are there. One is a safer travel, and two is insurance policy. I think we need to look into some good insurance policies as a private sector plus government joint ventures to see how we could insure people to have a safer peace of mind when they travel. Second thing is, is the vaccination part, which is what I completely agree with Gloria Guevara in saying that vaccination alone is not the solution. Because as I said before, to take five years for 70% of the world population to be vaccinated, what we need to do is depend more on a mix of vaccination, testing, and the antibodies testing as well, not just that. We need to make sure that all people of the world can start moving right now. Testing should become more affordable, cheaper and easier to get for people. Which brings me to my last point, which is basically the political will. Political will. We can't do this alone. Any country, we've seen some very good stories, some very good success stories, but no country is going to do it on its own. It's not how you do it. It's how you work with others to make it happen. That's a very important part, because no matter what, people are going to come to you from other countries. So when you're going to go to other countries, that's the nature of travel and tourism. It brings people together, it connects people. So unless the whole world is vaccinated, or the whole world comes to an agreement on protocols, we're not going to get anywhere. So bilateral agreements, as you said, are important, but more important are regional agreements first. You start with your neighborhood, and then you go to the whole world slowly. That's how things should happen. These are my takeaways. Thank you so much, Rajan, for everything. Thank you, my dear. Thank you so much, uh, Talib. Let me now turn to um, Megan uh, Elberholzer, who's the Portfolio Director for Travel, Tourism and Creative Industries uh, for Reed Exhibitions. Uh, I, must thank, I must also yeah. thank Reed and WTM for its partnership. We've been wonderful partners. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Right now, and to you, Megan, because uh, you are, as I say, work for Reed Exhibitions, you've got the portfolio in South Africa. What's your takeaway and what message would you like to give? Well, I think um, Dr. Taleb has really said it all, but what it comes back to is that public and private sector collaboration. Um, and that's really where we come in as Africa Travel Week, which is comprised of WTM Africa and ILT Africa. And it's working with our partners um, like ITIC. And I really want to thank them for this amazing partnership that we've enjoyed now for almost two years and, and working together for the future. Um, I think what's evident is that the need for content is there and the need to connect is there. And um, so I would just like to touch base on a few things that are coming up in 2021. Um, and we're really excited that come the 24th of June, we're going to be hosting a virtual African Tourism Investment Summit in partnership with ITIC. Um, so really excited uh, that that's coming around. And then even more exciting is when we hit September, which is Tourism Month in South Africa, we're going to be hosting the African Tourism Investment Summit with ITIC in a live format in the host city of Cape Town. Um, and hopefully by that stage, we'll see a lot of what has been discussed um, today coming to the fore and we'll have even more uh, conversations rolling off the back of that. So from our side, just a massive thank you. And we really appreciate everyone for joining. Um, I know that there are people from all around the world in different time zones. So thank you for taking your time. Megan, thank you very much indeed as well. And uh, hopefully we will all meet in September in Cape Town. Um, to you, Ibrahim, uh, Ayub, um, how, how have you felt the, the last couple of days has gone and, and what do you see happening in the uh, in the year ahead? I mean, it has been very uh, insightful for the past two days. And first of all, I would like to thank also WTM, right? Uh, I've been very proud to, uh, uh, to work with WTM. And this African uh, uh, Tourism Investment Summit has been really a, a very passionate uh, time working and working with all the speakers. Uh, I'm going to go to the chapter of uh, thanking all the speakers with all the different time zones, like Megan said. 
right now. I think we are very proud to contribute to that revival and rebuilding and to restart travel and tourism industry in Africa in that post pandemic to facilitate uh, and channeling investment into sustainable uh, and green uh, project. I mean, the, we, the, the key takeaways I think would be like Taleb has summarized it. Uh, I can't uh, go better than what Taleb has said, right? But I think the, the most important thing is to follow up on the vaccination process. I mean, Africa has been uh, I mean, we all said at the beginning, uh, I mean, the prediction uh, were that Africa would be ravaged with the pandemic, but that ha we have seen the contrary, right? And, and in fact, uh, with uh, uh, less death, uh, I mean, uh, uh, ha happening in, in the pandemic uh, in Africa, and also uh, less cases. I mean, there are certain exceptions, of course, but the process of the vaccination is very important for, for the continent for, to restart travel and tourism. And like Minister Balala said it rightly, that infrastructure, without infrastructure, you can't uh, open up. And, and I think that's the time now to do it. And the branding of Africa is, I think, very important because in order to change the narration, the narrative on, on how you position Africa, it's always been like you say, the stigmatization of, of, of the continent. I think that is something very important and what Marcus also said. And it's 1.3 billion people uh, within Africa and 1.4 billion people in China. And when you look about the bubble that could uh, uh, create, it's, 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 it's massive. And by the time Europe is going to restart, right? Like Claire said about uh, amazing how Rwanda got uh, the increase, the jump uh, from 17% uh, with uh, that branding of Rwanda on the Arsenal shirt. Or, and we don't know about Paris, about uh, Paris Saint-Germain in, in France, how, 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 what is the increase in, in, in French tourism. But, uh, but to tell you, that's quite interesting to, to see. We need to change that perception. Uh, and on the other side, uh, I, I believe uh, we, we, I mean, all that will help to restore trust and confidence among travelers and investors so that we all make the most of the business uh, opportunities that will emerge in the future, right? And hearing about Zubox uh, project, you know, in Madagascar is, is really fantastic and, and optimistic. And uh, Dr. Diamana, uh, Frederick, and uh, uh, John Piniger uh, about, about all the different areas on, the, on West Africa to develop. That's, that's really good news, I would say. I mean, in this conference, what we did uh, today is a teaser, like Megan said, we're going to do it to go and to have a continuation in June to build up. And, uh, and then when we all meet in September on the 1st to the 3rd, uh, I mean, we need to bring that challenge of what Minister Balala, what you said this morning, and with the Commonwealth, the EU and other partners uh, like Malaga, um, Greece and so forth, we can bring together on, on the 1st and the 3rd uh, of September to bring this African ideas he would like to, to, to help, to bring that ministerial summit uh, in, in, in Cape Town. That would be, would be really interesting. So that's uh, what, what, I, what I would gather. But on the other side, I would like, if you have uh, some more minutes uh, allocated, uh, I would like to thank all the valued, uh, valued, valued speakers that contributed, and especially you know all the ministers who have graciously uh, participated, uh, showing uh, that has showed, of course, their high-level commitment uniting Africa for the betterment of the continent, and and that's very good. I think we got like uh, nine or over eight or nine ministers participating, so that's that's quite quite interesting. Uh, I would like also to thank my back office team. Right. Without the back office team, this event would not have been able to be uh, to be made, to be successful. Costas, I will name. Uh, I will uh, put some names here: Costas, Sotiris, Elisha, Isrina, Jovan, George, and the WTM team. Megan, your team, uh, uh, Amanda, Martin, uh, uh, with whom I have been working with. Uh, I mean, tirelessly uh, in order to make it successful. We've been on the phone, on WhatsApp, on email non-stop, I mean, night and days, we have not looked at the time, but I think all the team, it's, it's been a very good team, I would say, very collaborative type of work. And to my ITIC directors, Paul,
uh, you made this fantastic job. I mean, who has been uh, all the time on the investment side. But Gerald, <laughs> Gerald Lawless, unfortunately, couldn't be with us today. I mean, I'm sure he's watching us, I mean, from where he is uh, at his home, recovering from his recent surgery. Uh, successful, I would say. And on, and on, on the last, but is our chairman, Dr. Taleb Rifai, who has been instrumental for the success of ITIC since its inception. Thank you, Taleb. Right. You're and then, we should thank you also, Ibrahim. You forgot yourself. <laughs> You're the one that made it all happen. Thank and you. I think we should also thank Rajan, who's done us another splendid and, job. And, and, and Rajan. Of course, of course, I'm coming to Rajan. <laughs> oh, I think Rajan you're... has been with us now for almost two years. You know, almost, um, I mean, I would say, uh, uh, yeah, right? We've been, uh, uh, I mean, I think Rajan knows ITIC better than us now. <laughs> He's one of us. He's one of us. <laughs> one of us, yes, absolutely. And, and I would like to thank also all our supporting partners. I mean, WTPC. Gloria Guevara has been a very good supporter of ITIC from the very beginning when we started WTTC. Uh, we've been with us, right? And thank you, Gloria, and make a valuable contribution about, uh, about uh, each time and on investment, on her uh, valuable insight, and also on the figures. When, when you look about the accurate figures, and, and I would say WTTC has been one of the organization that has been on the forefront since this pandemic started to, to try to bring all sorts of solution. I, I mean, try to unite everybody together and, and well done WTTC, thank you so much. Cuthbert and QB of, uh, of uh, ATB, I mean, trying to bring all Africa under one roof. I think he is uh, working day and night to, 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 to fight for Africa. Thank you Cuthbert and, and would, would, would like to work with you. And also, uh, I would like to bring on the Commonwealth Entrepreneur Club here, and MP and uh, Vice Chairman of Commonwealth, Jan uh, Little Granger. I mean, we, we, we are having exciting times. I, I know we are going to do a, a, a project with the Commonwealth on the 7th of, June, of July, excuse me, so which we are going to announce very soon. So that is going to be exciting. I mean, of bringing back all the Commonwealth together. We had an ex ex exceptional, panel last November that was moderated by the BBC, uh, your colleague uh, Rajan um, Lerato. And now we have built up again today and we have seen the, co the, the, the commitment that the Commonwealth want to bring to Africa. And the UK post Brexit, I would say, is quite amazing and, and good news. The EU, uh, Greece, Malaga, the only other uh, uh, countries that are willing to work with uh, with, with Africa. Thank you, uh, Jan and Mobin. Professor Lee Miles and Dimitrios from Boone Mount University, thank you for, for the partnership. Uh, we love to, to have this partnership again. Uh, uh, the Boone Mount has been with us from the very beginning, you know, and all our partners uh, are, are loyal partners, I would say. And our PR company, Think Partners, right, who is doing a tremendous amount of work behind the scene. To, uh, to, to make, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, ITIC to be successful, right? So, so that's, that's really interesting. Uh, very, very, very uh, brief. Our next summit with Reed would be at ATM uh, in, in a month time almost, like 19th and 27th of May, so that you can join us uh, for the Middle East Summit. Uh, I talk about uh, the Commonwealth, and obviously with Africa, we are going to do the two summit, like Megan said, and I said earlier, right? We would love uh, all of you to follow us and we will follow up the progress uh, from this summit we've done today and the progress along the way to June and to September, where we are going to bring everybody, uh, everybody together. And, my, and of course, we are going to be in London, right? With WTM, uh, hopefully that the September and the November conference are going to be live because we can't wait to be, see each other in person, right? And by that time, we will make uh, good progress. And my last message, I would say to my brothers and sisters of, of Africa, let's unite our de destiny, you know, during this pandemic time and during this summit, and also to pave the way for the betterment of our beloved continent. Thank you so much. 
Ibrahim, thank you. And I think just a few words now from Paul, because in many ways, that last session, Paul, shows that there is vibrancy, there is desire for future investment to happen, that, that Africa is very much open for business when it comes to investment. Times may be tough at the moment, but the future is very, very bright for Africa. Absolutely no question about it. And just the three projects which we heard about uh, today uh, fill one with excitement and enthusiasm. And I mean, the investment they're looking for is not uh, thousands of billions of dollars, but in hundreds and some in terms of tens. Uh, but it's not just a question of what these uh, developments bring. I mean, yes, they are hotel, they are resort, uh, they are eco lodges, but they're all complying now with environmental and sustainable goals as established by the United Nations, which can only be for the good. And of course, it's not just the question of the investment and the development, but along with that goes greater wealth for the people of the countries and the towns and villages, uh, education, employment, and uh, and growing wealth little by little, building up um, the various territories. So it's really fantastic and exciting to be part of this industry still now, which I've been connected with for many decades, um, in common with uh, my good partners in business, uh, Dr. Rafai and uh, Ibrahim Ayub. And I have been involved with world travel markets since it very first started in London in 1979, if I'm correct. <laughs> so now to see uh, our to be involved and have uh, connections with WTM Africa and elsewhere around the world, and with the upcoming Arabian travel market, which we are privileged to be working again with WTM and Reed, uh, it, things can only get better. And and it's been a pleasure to be part of the whole process uh, and going forward. Thank you very much. A very suitable note on which to end. Thank you very much. And on behalf of all of us here, thank you very much for joining us today and yesterday. And we will see you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Rajan. Bye -bye. Thank you, Rajan. Thank Bye -bye. you very much.